Julie, I have 7.30. Are people continuing to join or, yeah? All right. I'll give it another maybe minute or two and then, and then get going. Yeah. All right, um, I guess it's, uh, so it's, I have 731, so uh, let's call this meeting of CBDC to order. Um, we've got a good number of folks here, right? 43, and, and I think probably still counting. Um, but with that, uh, Julie, if you can go over uh, the, the rules uh, of the road here tonight for, um, for Zoom. Appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Thank you, John. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy lives. Um, beautiful evening to join us for the CPDC 2021 zoning workshop. Um, this year's focus is the downtown Smart Growth District. Um, so, with us tonight from staff, uh, I'm Julie Mercier, Community Development Director. Um, we also have Andrew McNichol, Staff Planner, and Aaron Schaefer, Economic Development Director. From the CPDC, we have Chair John Weston. We have Nick Safina. Heather Klish, Tony Duretto, Pamela Adrian, and Linda Harrison. Um, so this meeting is being recorded by RCTV. Um, it's being, and it may also be broadcast live, I'm not sure. Um, it's being run over Zoom, a couple of ground rules for Zoom that we ask that you please remain muted at all times unless you have been identified and are, are providing a comment. This is a little bit different than our normal like public hearings that we run with CPDC. Um, and it will be a little bit more interactive, but. Um, during the presentation by staff, um, it would be great if you could please remain muted. Um, the, the chat feature we typically ask people not to use um, during an open public meeting, it may be, be used later during the breakout sessions um, if, if that's something that you would rather do versus like speaking. Um, so we have a lot that we're going to pack into tonight, um, and I'm just going to quickly share my screen and get started with this presentation and then uh, you'll see we're going to turn it back to you pretty quickly so um, all right okay so do you all see on your screens um a powerpoint presentation that says downtown smart growth district put it in slideshow mode okay um, so outline for tonight, we're going to start with a visioning session, asking all of you to let us know what you think that downtown should, or look, uh, what you would desire for the downtown to look like in 20 years. Um, Julie, I think you might be sharing the wrong screen because you're sharing the presenter view, which shows the current slide and the next slide. And oh. if you, if you have two screens, um, I think your slideshow mode is on the other screen. Okay, let me see, how do I get rid of that? Um, you can also change display settings to, I think it's something like mirror. All right, sorry about that, everyone, hold on one second. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm actually gonna just do my PDF version. It's one way to do it. Let me just change my pictures. Thank you for letting me know. And we'll do now. Um, Do you see the workshop outline? Okay, so great. thank you for letting me know about that. Um, I don't actually screen share PowerPoints very often. Um, 
So just jumping back into this after the visioning session where we ask you in 30 seconds to let us know what you want downtown to look like in 20 years, we're gonna jump into a um, large, but hope, hopefully pretty quick presentation by staff with an overview of 40R and the focus areas for tonight. Um, and then we're gonna go into breakout sessions for each focus area. There are three focus areas, um, lot coverage and dimensional requirements, open space greenery and pathways and parking requirements. Um, and then after the breakout sessions, we're gonna have a report out and, and back to me, I'm gonna talk about next steps going forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to John and if you can please uh, kick off the visioning aspect of this, that'd be great. Sure. So thank you everyone for joining, um, you know, with, we have 50 people, um, I've got to say that, right, that's a pretty good turnout um, when we typically have um, zoning workshops. We're lucky if we get, um, what, Julie, 10 um, would be a, a big turnout. So, you know, this might, this format actually, hopefully uh, uh, works well and, and I think may work well for, for people um, to, to um, uh, understand what's going on and provide provide feedback um, to us. So uh, what we really wa wanted to start out with is really understanding and what the whole the whole uh, idea of tonight is 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 for people to provide us with um, with input on what what the downtown should look like. Um, so um, Julie will go over in her presentation sort of how we got to to where we are in terms of um, in terms of zoning, but you know zoning is is pretty dry and and pretty complicated, um, and um, you know sometimes we can set out rules and we don't even understand fully what the rules will uh, will result in. Um, uh, but we we try our best right to to get those rules to to set up the rules so that the outcomes are what we want, but but. What we really want to do is uh, is is not focus in on the details of the the words and the zoning. We want to um, tonight. It, we want to have a discussion on really where are we trying to go, so that we can tailor the zoning to try and to to try and get to that that um, that vision. Um, we haven't had at least you know I've been on CPDC for a long time and um, we. We haven't had a real, I'm gonna say a true visioning kind of a process um, uh, in a very long time. I, I'll say, um, and I, I'm not even gonna try and um, try and put a date on it, but um, I know a, a while back we had a, a big World Cafe event um, where there was a lot of uh, sort of vision of not only downtown, but the town itself. I think we followed up with, Another uh, World Cafe event that was a little bit smaller, um, and we've had some other visioning, you know, to get it, um, events that try to get a sense of of where we're headed. But you know, it's always good to to revisit that, and especially now, so since we have some actual, you know, some some buildings um, either occupied or going up, uh, that that um, might be a little bit easier to for people to understand of where at least the current set of zoning regulations are 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 leading us um and so uh really i just wanted to give everyone um you know anyone a a, a couple of of uh, i'll say a couple of seconds a minute or so um to go over and provide some input to to everyone on where what 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 the downtown ought to look like um in in 20 years. 20 years is no magical number, no magical year. Um, that's just a good uh, planning horizon, right? 10 years, it, it takes a long time for, for any land use um, uh, uh, control to, to end up with, with results. Um, and, and I'll start out, not that my uh, vision is any more important than anyone else's, but just to sort of get you, that get the ball rolling. Um, I, um, my my vision for the downtown is um, is for it to uh, be uh, even more vibrant than it is now, um, and and uh, you know COVID aside, right? Um, uh, we have some some great restaurants in in downtown. I see Liz here, and um, uh, uh, you know a, a nice bookstore. 
Um, and, and what I'd like to see is more of that type of, um, type of development, um, uh, a, a downtown that um, is uh, active in, uh, not only in the middle of the day at lunch, but, but in the evening and, and, uh, and in the morning. Um, uh, and a place where, um, where not only do you go to, you know, work and sit in your office, but there are other things to do that will draw, um, maybe not only folks from Reading, but from folks from other ah. people to, um, no. to downtown and have, uh, downtown Reading be, a, a desirable location for people, people to come. That's my vision. Um, and, um, but it would be great to hear what what other people um, what other people would like to see. Um, and so, with that, I would ask that um, that if if you want to put your vision out there or put some ideas out there, um, I guess raise your hand from a, a Zoom sort of way, right? Um, uh, and then Julie will be monitoring that, and and we can call on on folks. Um, we will get into, as Julie mentioned, we will get into some of the sort of more details and more nitty gritty in terms of of um, zoning as we um, as we get further into the presentation. But thought this might be a good idea on on a, a way to start. So yeah, like like John said, if you want to raise your hand like this, I can see many people on my screen. Or if you want to use the raise hand feature in chat, we can call on you, um, John. The first hand I saw go up was David Corey. All right, David. Yeah, hi there. Um, thanks, John. I, I um, echo many of the things that you said about the downtown, um, wanting it to be you know a vibrant place, a destination, um, some place that's busy not just on weekends. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would like. For um, you know, I think we have we have many um, restaurants and shops, um, and one thing uh, there's actually a couple things that I think are missing that I would love to see. Um, one is sort of entertainment kind of venues, um, and you know I've I've seen old old pictures of Reading, and there used to be a movie theater, right? Or um, you know I don't know an escape room place, or you know something that was a um, some kind of entertainment venue, a bowling alley. I don't know um, something that's that's more than just um, going for dinner or going to to shop. Um, and then the other thing that I'd like to see is um, you know honestly I'd, I'd love to see something like a Trader Joe's um, or something that you know kind of approached a um, grocery store down, downtown. And I know that we have Market Basket and Stop and Shop, um, you know, over on Commerce Way. Um, you know, I live what used to be walking distance to the Atlantic, and I still miss the Atlantic. Um, so, you know, would would love to have something um, that sort of approached that more than just a convenience store. You know, and Professor's Market is great, um, but um, you know, it doesn't doesn't always fit the bill. Understood. Great. Thank you. Um, the next one I saw come up was Cindy. Hi. Hi, Cindy. Um, I would second what David just said. Um, my I started with the big picture. I would want it to continue to be pedestrian friendly and bike friendly. Um, for, to me, it's important to preserve the historic buildings, even the cemetery. A lot of people have been walking there for COVID and it could use some attention, um, perhaps some more outdoor seating and definitely preserve the green and trees and gardens, some nice gardens have gone in. Um, but I do think with all the apart, this is selfish. It's not just because I think Trader Joe's is fun. It's, it's pretty good, but um, with all the, we live on Gould Street. So with all the people living in the apartment buildings at Postmark and on Gould Street and down at the train station and then by professors, we need to uh, make sure that ours is a walkable, sustainable town. And so a grocery store in walking distance that you don't have to cross major roads uh, is a huge. Also, we have two vacant places, you know, the Rite Aid and the Walgreens. Um, so 
I think something like Trader Joe's would be perfect um, because it's such a, a cool, um, and I think that there was talk that it was wooed once and, and then something happened and they went away, but maybe we could approach them again. Um, I, I think David's idea of a bowling alley is kind of cool, but I, I do think um, art is, uh, would go for some kind of uh, gallery or art center or place to have uh, concerts um, so that it was more um, interactive and cultural. I think we're missing a cultural um, center. So I would, that I would ask for something like that more than bowling right now. <laughs> I love bowling though. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz? Thanks. Um, so yes, yes to everything that has been said thus far, although um, I feel that Trader Joe's has said a thousand times they're not coming here. So I think we need to set our sights on a different um, grocery store partner and brainstorm. Um, not that I wouldn't love it. We all would, but they have said no very clearly. Um, so I'll be, I'll be the bearer of that news. Mm -hmm. um, to build on something that's already been happening downtown and, and to second something that Cindy said, I just wanted to talk about public art. Um, I think the, the wraps that the Historic Commission um, supported on all the electrical boxes are great. I would love to see you know the mural that we have in the alley uh, between the uh, CVS side, front and back sides of those two different parking lots. I would love to see more murals. Um, I would love to see sculpture and um, you know, a lot of public art is also um, things that kids can play on or that people can sit on. Um, so I love the idea of uh, physical public art. Uh oh, I think we've got a little Zoom crash. Well, that's not something I'm going to. Really to be clear, that was not the sort of public art I was thinking. Oh, <laughs> uh, God, I hope not. Sorry about that, everybody. I believe he has been removed, so yes, apologies. It's very hard to control the screen when that's happening. Um, Liz, I'm sorry. So, did you um, did you have something more public art? Uh, no, I, I really okay. I don't need to reiterate everything everyone right. else. Okay. I really was just okay. wanting to focus on the art piece. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Barry. Oh, great! I heard the old expression: "Don't follow kids or porn." So, well, first of all, thanks for for organizing this. Um, I, I actually want to I want to really reiterate the whole notion of a of a cultural use downtown. Um, if you look at sort of older downtowns that reinvented themselves, um, think of Newburyport, think of New Bedford, think of Beverly. All of those places really led not with stores or Trader Joe's. They read they led with art, performance. Uh, venues, um, you know, galleries, things like that. And I know that we have, I think, uh, sort of an overlay cultural district that really almost coincides a lot with the 40R district. So I, I'd like to see, because we're going to have, we have tons of people now going to be living downtown. Some of them already are, but we haven't met our neighbors yet because none of us really have been able to go downtown for a year, but like, this is gonna pass. And, you know, we're gonna have hundreds and hundreds of new neighbors that we're all gonna be able to meet. And I think as far as the, you know, the supermarket or a market, um, I, I think the, 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 the economic market will respond to that once, you know, all these, once we integrate a lot of these new projects in there, there'll be the demand for those things. And we may see some version of a market in there. So. Um, I, I would like to sort of see any new developments or, or, or just sort of create a vision where whether it's a, you know, a cultural center, a place that people can go hear music, or that we have multiple venues in some of the new projects where they can lend some of their space for, you know, mobile galleries or, or you know, some of the retail stuff that may or may not be 
you know, rent it out, just to kind of have a place where we can draw people from. I, I think um, we're going to have a lot of new people living downtown, but I also think it should be our absolute goal to draw people who don't, who don't live in Reading to come to Reading, which means there'll be multiple restaurants, multiple places to go. Um, and so, you know, that was sort of my vision when, you know, I started looking at this and um, we definitely have the pieces in place to do it. Great. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Uh, David, David O'Sullivan. Hey, um, yeah, a couple things. I think the cultural thing is a good thing. I want to emphasize restaurants because I think that if you talk to the existing restaurant owners, they encourage others to open restaurants because you find that when people have choices, they'll come downtown and maybe do one one time, one another time. But if there's only one restaurant, they're more worried that it might be crowded and they can't go there. So they restaurants seem tend to be successful in groups. Um, the other thing I think is somebody mentioned some park benches and other things. I think that um, having some more public open space of some kind, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we've, we've gotten some developments. I mean, I was the architect for the postmark and I think we've created a nice courtyard on the side, but that's really residential. It's not that it's public to view, but it's not something public would enter but some other kind of public space, um, you know, whether it's a place to sit with more benches. I think that the downtown revitalization in front of CVS and all was very successful that way. And if we can extend that concept farther down. I also wonder if there's a market for people that would have more kind of live work spaces, which might start to add to that cultural and that art kind of thing where you know, some of the new developments or some of the new, uh, the existing buildings could be, become more live work where somebody who is doing you know, craft store or art gallery or something that becomes part of their living space, therefore it's not costing the high amount that a retail rent's gonna get that they can't afford. That's my great two cents. Thank you. Uh, Christy. Three real quick things. I would like to see more trees along the streets. I would like to see more space between the street and the sidewalk and some of the newer buildings, but not have them right at the edge. And it would be so nice if, I mean, I'm all for the cultural and the restaurants, but can we please have parking with it? I live right near downtown. I'm walking around there all the time, except in bad weather or if it's too late or so on. So there's mine. All right, thanks. Um, Lauren. Hi, uh, I actually just moved to Reading at the beginning of the pandemic, which is a terrible time to get to know your new community. Um, so speaking admittedly as a bit of a newbie, um, I think I've really appreciated a lot of people's suggestions about the different uh, businesses that they'd like to see. I know that some of them are really difficult without having more density than what Reading is probably going to be able to offer. So I hope in addition to the zoning considerations that we also think about ways to temporarily create some of those uses. Um, I mean, can we restructure a public space to offer more space for events? Can we do movies in the park in lieu of a movie theater downtown? Um, what other cultural district management kinds of um, initiatives can we pursue to sort of bring some of these active entertainment and cultural uses without having to wait around for a business that's ready to take a chance or uh, a building that would be a good fit for something like that. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Dave Talbot. Everybody, thank, thank you, John. And thanks everybody for the work you're doing downtown. So many nice things happening. Um, echoing some of the other comments, um, Mr. O'Sullivan's and the recent speaker, you know, the open space I think is the critical piece um, to make make it less, um, for lack of a better word, you know, barren. Some of these buildings that fill the entire lots, um, when you add them together, you end up with a canyon-like feel. And the the place I'm most concerned about, and I think others might feel the same, is 
if the Rite Aid um, site, which is vacant <clears throat> near the train station, if that site and its parking lot and its little uh, planting and mature trees, if all of that is dug out and replaced with a 100 square, 100 percent lot coverage building, it really will make a kind of a canyon on Haven Street. And there's a real opportunity to address some of the open space in terms of having the mass of the building be where the existing building is now and the area that's now the parking lot and the treed area becoming a park um, would really, I think, balance the massiveness of the 3052 Haven project, which is, I think, exhibit A for some of the concerns I, as I and others have expressed. That's not a building that really invites um, a place to sit or walk through and around. Uh, I realized there was that little bump out added, uh, taking some parking away, adding that little concrete bunk bump out. But I think there, you know, I just think it'll it'll be better if we have some of these open spaces. Um, and so that's my feedback, especially with the Rite Aid site as the immediate concern. Um, long term, if there was a way to do a pedestrian overpass over Route 28, linking the Walker's Brook uh, shopping areas to you know, and the RMLD site, which is another one that as a commissioner, I hope we can, you know, that's something we can all be looking at how to use that site better over the coming decades. You know, if there's a way to move people from the depot area over to the uh, shopping mall area on foot and bicycles would be very, very exciting. Um, a very, very exciting thing to do, very expensive. I think I've talked to you about that in the past, John, and you've, but anyway, um, <laughs> two things. Um, you know, that I think would be wonderful for the downtown. Great, thank you. Uh, Bernie Horn. Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, so I have a few comments. Um, first, um, one thing that we haven't done is set out objectives. And I, I um, have a sense that we should probably be explicit about that, or at least staff should you know, enumerate what those are, because it would appear that at this stage, the, you know, the objective seems like maximize tax revenues by development. Uh, certainly from what's already happened, that appears to be the objective. I think we should clearly state that. I guess I'll, I'll come back to that. But I would um, reiterate some of the prior comments. And I think, you know, I feel as a chamber member, I feel that the you know downtown businesses deserve you know some support from the from the town and i think the problem is that there are many different ways of doing that one is to create a huge amount of density which would put a lot of people downtown and therefore may populate the um, the re you know the restaurants and the businesses however that also has a very negative consequence for the rest of you know the residents who are not living downtown and want to use it. Um, I know that as it gets more and more dense, I'm less likely to use it. I can use as an example Rockport, where we also have a home. And this is a town which admittedly is very different than Reading in that it's extremely seasonal. However, the chamber there is extraordinarily, um, I think it's probably one of the best chambers in the Northeast of the US because there is, is rarely a weekend that goes by where there isn't a tremendous, you know, a, a really interesting cultural or other event. Uh, they, they recently built, uh, uh, and, and which is something that we supported, a music center there. And it is amazing how much that brings stuff in without having to have huge buildings taking up every square inch of a, of a building lot. And so what this does is it invites quite a lot of the neighbors around. So I would, I would say that that's one alternative to creating density. Um, I think also having ease of access, you know, we can love to have any number of businesses downtown. However, if they cannot survive because it's either too difficult to park or, or we're hostile to traffic trying to come into town, you know, from our neighbors, that's not going to help the businesses, and and you know we've already made decisions to put big box retailers, you know, within an arm's throw of downtown. So trying to think that downtown is is going to be able to compete with that, 
is a tall order. So we really, I think, have to understand, you know, the real economics uh, of what's going on down there. Um, so so thank you. Th thank you. So, right, we just, we're not trying to solve everything right now. We just want sort of like the vision of where, where we, we think we're heading. And certainly, right, some of the stuff I grew up in Rockport and, and, you know, some of the, the cultural things that they do in all the, the, the spaces that they have, they are all those um, uh, uh, private spaces that are made public for, for the venues. They do, they do a great job there. It would be great if we could, um, if, if we could facilitate some of the, some more of those those same spaces in in Reading that we don't have now um, so right we're, we're running um, uh, small on time I've got I've got three people that still have their their hands up um, and I will call on them and then <clears throat> and then we'll we'll move um, uh, to Julie's presentation um, the first uh, Mary Ellen O'Neill Thanks, John. Um, I just wanted to some some of my topics have been covered, but um, I'm concerned that you know we do have 100% law coverage down there. We're losing ground quickly unless we move as quickly as we can with these changes, especially in the lot coverage area. Um, I think the idea of, that people have talked about the trees, the greenery, um, little parklets, pathways, whatever we can do to give a sense of space and being able to breathe and circulate and move because we want more people, more outdoor dining. Um, it'll make it all much more pleasant um, as we face uh, increasing temperatures. So that's my main point. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you. Uh, Angela? Hi, John, thank you. Angela Benda, 10 Orchard Park Drive. Um, I think everything that people have said about arts, wonderful arts organization, get more um, involved with that. I like uh, space to hang out. The kinds of things that I'd like to see um, are more organic developments uh, or places. Melrose Highland. Melrose Highlands has a really funky tapas breakfast um, restaurant and across the street uh, a tapas restaurant. In Wakefield there is a breakfast place that has a great space outside. It reminded me a lot. It reminds me a lot of the Chronicle building. You know, the, I think the Chronicle building would have been a wonderful restaurant with seating outside. I think we need to consider that businesses, um, the older businesses have, or the older buildings might have lower rent. They're cheaper. You can get people in who are trying to open up a knitting shop or a restaurant. When you have these larger buildings that have higher rents that are really developed, you end up with the doctor's offices and you end up with the chains because the rent is very high. So I would like to see preservation of some of the older buildings to allow, there have been studies that have been done that have shown that if you want to if you want more innovative and, and smaller businesses that they need lower rent spaces and some of those lower rent spaces are the older buildings, they're not the, the newer buildings that we're building. So when you, when you knock everything down and you build new, then you are sort of saying what you want and who can afford it. So I, I'd like to see a more, more, organic, more small business, more innovative businesses, arts organizations, walkable space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephen. Stephen? Stephen. Stephen Wainish. Hi. Oh, Stephen. Uh, yeah. uh, I live in uh, Minot Street. Thanks for uh, giving us a chance to speak. Uh, we got three quick points. Um, I'm really glad to see people wanting to live in Reading. Um, people living in Reading is critical to getting downtown Reading um, vibrant. Uh, without people, it's just, it's not going to happen. Um, for, I also think that, I'm not quite sure how we'd be able to uh, encourage it, but I think that a, a shop, shopping local or encouraging local businesses, I see Whitlam books here, um, you know, Trader Joe's is, is, is great and all, but, you know, if we want 
businesses to take care of a public space, then we're going to get a better chance of that by encouraging locally owned businesses. Um, I think that's almost, if not just as important as the people actually being there. Um, and then the last thing I'd want to address a little bit is about the parking. You know, the best places to live um, never have enough parking. They just don't because they're made for people. And, you know, I mean, I get it. It's part of like uh, an American culture, but if we're talking about a downtown, you know, those two things don't always uh, mix. And I think that, you know, people, you're, you're not going to have anything unless you have the people there, you know, having a big car lot is, is not going to solve uh, the problems, but I understand there's a lot to it. Um, and, you know, related to that, the um, uh, improvements on the hardscaping that was done several years ago, I mean, I think that that really addresses how downtown Reading can be made more pedestrian friendly and, and done really well. And that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, and then we got one comment in from um, uh, Mike Monahan. Um, and he says that, um, you know, he's concerned about the, the number of large multifamily buildings um, and uh, that he, he thinks that we need to get more green space um, and, and not as much as not as much large uh, new, new housing units. Um, all right. Well, thank you. I think, right, that was that was good. There's a lot of good ideas. There are a lot of things to, to think about and and gives us some, um, you know, some input on on how to um, how to amend and and craft um, uh, the zoning as we as we move along and and um, and try and go from where we are now to where where we want to be. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn things over to, to Julie. Um, she pulled together a great presentation to go over 40R, um, you know, which is a zoning tool that we have to, to use here um, and, and put into perspective a couple of the things that, um, that um, was really the, I, I should really back up, I'm sorry, um, really the impetus of, of, um, of dealing with a couple of the, the items that we um, that we want to deal with specifically uh, this year, um, you know, both Mary Ellen and um, and and Dave uh, Talbot mentioned, you know, there's going to continue to be uh, development, and um, uh, and so we want to make sure that the development that happens in the coming years, you know, fits with the way that the the town wants it to. Um, and one of the things that was expressed at town meeting was there was an instructional motion to. To look at um, lot coverage and um, and and green space, um, and so I I so um, we want to we want to uh, you know be responsive to town meeting um, and the wishes of of town meeting, but make sure that the uh, zoning that we we um, bring back to town meeting actually uh, meets the the goals of what town meeting um, thinks it will, and so that's why we're gonna. Focus, I think, specifically on on three areas of of zoning, um, and that is a lot coverage, parking, and um, and open space. Um, and uh, so, Julie will go over the presentation. We're going to focus in on those uh, those three areas, um, and we'll go from there. Great, thank you, John. Um, I think I figured out how to the PowerPoint. Um, and while I'm getting set up, I did want to point out that Pam had a comment she would like to add. So Pam, do you want to? Yeah, my point was, John, that it would be nice if we could have a farmer's market on a more frequent basis in the location where it's been. That would be really good. It seemed to bring people out. That was it. Thank you, Pam. Okay, so I'm gonna try this. I think I figured it out. You'll just have to let me know. 
that look right to everyone? Now it does. Okay. All right. Great. You can teach an old dog new tricks. All right. Um, so just really quick, one to remind everyone, I don't think I said it earlier, um, after I go through this quick presentation, we're going to go into breakout sessions um, into the three focus areas. You will get to self-select which focus area you want to go into. So, um, you know, pay attention and um, see what you're interested in from this presentation. Tonight's goals, um, inspired conversations, targeted feedback, idea generation for zoning amendments. Um, we're really focusing on like what things we can change related to zoning. So just really quickly, what is 40R? 40R is a state statute um, that allows towns to adopt zoning at the local level for um, smart growth. And actually they changed it in 2017. So it's also like a starter home zoning statute. Um, it's also in the code of municipal regulations. There's guidelines established in um, the mass general laws and the CMR. Um, basically to like summarize what's on the screen here, um, you know, Smart growth zoning, it incentivizes and prioritizes infill development near services and transit um, that's equitable and provides for depth of housing stock in suburban communities, um, other communities as well, but we, Reading's a suburban community. Um, smart growth promotes mixed use, diverse housing opportunities, compact design, and, and a list of things that are here on the screen. I'm gonna go quickly because we're running a little bit. We wanna hear more from you than from us. Um, so 40R at the local level, this is not an exhaustive list um, by any means, but um, the local authority we have, we can set dimensional controls like setbacks, height, lot coverage. Um, we can establish criteria that enable the Community Planning and Development Commission to, to decide which things they can waive. Um, so we can't waive the affordability component. Um, and then there are, that, that's really like the one main thing we can't waive, um, or the CPDC can't waive. Um, and then we can have design guidelines. So the design guidelines have a lot of strength. Some communities actually put them into the zoning. Um, we have ours separate from zoning, but they carry a lot of weight. Um, local limitations, um, like I mentioned, like the minimum affordability requirement, we can't change. And actually Reading went a little bit above and beyond uh, the minimum. Um, we actually asked for more than is required. Um, minimum density and the percent gross floor area of residential. So. Um, that's, I think, 51% uh, has to be at least resident. At least 51% has to be residential. Um, however, given all of this, um, even though we have certain certain authority and certain leverage and things we can control, um, the state, the Department of Housing and Community Development has to review any changes that we make to zoning and to the design guidelines. And they have this, like, this criteria they look at, um, this term called unreasonably impair. So we can't unreasonably impair development by creating like zoning that's infeasible and, and that no one would ever be able to use to develop. Um, 40R is really a tool to like incentivize the development of housing, right? Okay. So our downtown 40R district really quick, um, it's relatively small, it's about 48 acres. When we expanded the district in 2017, um, the state estimated that we had about 17 acres that they would consider in their terminology to be developable. Um, they have like some very convoluted terminology in the Code of Municipal Regulations um, that uh, we can talk about offline at some point if you're interested. Um, our downtown includes the Kinga Rail Station um, and the lots are pretty small. So there's 148 lots total. Um, the median lot size is about 6,300 square feet. Um, an example of a property that's that size is actually the Latham Law Building um, and property, which is on the corner of Pleasant Street and Main Street. Um, and then the average lot size is about 10,000 square feet. And an example of that is 128 Tire, which is right next to the Rise 475 building. Um, so it's right at the corner of Washington and Main Street. So why 4DR? Um, this um, basically, this uh, chart here kind of like looks at the year that the housing stock was constructed, right? So um, you can see if you're looking at the pie, um, the orange and the and the like aqua colors, a lot of the housing stock in Reading was built um, prior to 1939 um, or in the 40s and 50s. And then as you get into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, it starts to slow down a little, but it levels off um, in the three decades from 1970 to 2000. So um, in this little chart here by the arrow. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you? 
see where I'm, you can, okay, all right, that's great. So that's helpful to me. Um, so basically, you know, uh, growth of housing was pretty steady in the three decades from 1970 to 2000. Um, there was a bit of a lull from 2000 to 2009, and then it picked up again um, in the last 10 years. So again, why 40R? Um, there's a clear demand for multifamily. So, um, you know, with young professionals looking for more downtown living and then um, older people looking to downsize and stay within the community. Um, you know, the, the, we zone for multifamily, developers think it's viable, they come, they construct it, and then the market absorbs it really quickly. Um, in many cases, like unit, these units are sold or under agreement before they're even finished with construction. So, um, you know, that, that indicates uh, pent up demand. So, moving right along. Why 40 year? Um, regional growth projections indicate that housing demand will be substantial, will continue to be substantial, right? So, um, you know, the Boston area is very economically resilient. Um, we're lucky to live in this area of the country. Um, we can weather economic downturns and things like the past year a little bit better than many other regions of the country. Um, housing values, jobs, and wages are strong. Um, you know, that's not to diminish that there are real struggles um, or to overlook that, um, you know, the strengths of the economy don't necessarily um, benefit everyone equally, right? Um, but that in and of itself could be yet another case for 40R, right? Because 40R is a tool um, that we can use at the local level to, to try to have more um, equitable housing opportunities for people that want to live in Reading. Um, so what I have here on this slide are two growth scenarios. These, um, whoever's unmuted, could you I'm getting some feedback? Thank you. Um, so these growth scenarios are from um, a Metropolitan Area Planning Council um, white paper on population and housing demand projections um, that was done in 2014. So there's the status quo scenario, which is basically like a continuation of existing rates of births, deaths, migration, and housing occupancy. Um, and then there's the stronger region scenario, which assumes that the region's actually going to attract and retain more people, um, more young professionals, uh, younger people that want downtown living, um, and, and older people who want to downsize. So it's so these are the two scenarios. Um, based on these scenarios, Reading's share of regional growth um, is projected to be between about 1,600 to 2,000 new housing units, which is about um, you know 530 to 680 new units per decade, which is actually right on pace and even a little bit less than the decades from 1970 to 2000, right? Um, and since 2000, we've produced about 1,200 units, so or an average of 605. So we are you know basically right in the middle of that estimate of 530 to 680. So we are right on pace. And that's actually representing a little bit less growth than in the years, the decades, 1970 to 2000. Um, so again, not to lay it on too thick, but why 40R? So 40R enables the town to accommodate our share of regional growth by determining where it's located um, and to manage it by ensuring it's concentrated near services, equitable and designed to fit within its context such that it strengthens the existing community. So we don't want to underestimate um, the investment in Reading that comes from incentivizing new growth. Um, you know, investment in Reading, um, the housing production yields significant tax revenue. It can be considered economic development in its own right. Um, incentivizing this new growth, like saying, you know, the growth is going to happen. We're using this tool, this, this 40 yards, an engine or a tool to kind of say, this is where we want it to be, right? Um, we want it to be in, in, in locations where people can access the train, they can access services. Um, it's the kind of housing, we're providing a diversity of housing stock, we're providing housing that, that trends are showing that people want, right? The growth is gonna happen and we are taking control of, of where it's located, right? Um, it also helps keep downtown vital, um, preventing stagnation and decay and breathing new life into town by bringing in new residents um, with um, ideas and new backgrounds. 
but just quickly to go through a history of 40R in Reading. Um, We've had 40R in some form since 2007. So we have the Gateway Smart Growth District, which is where Reading Woods is, which is at the southern end of the community for anyone on the call tonight who's new to town. Um, and then you know, a couple of years later, we adopted the first iteration of the Downtown Smart Growth District. Um, fast forwarding to, um, to today, you know, over the years since the Downtown Smart Growth District, you know, we've continued to evolve and respond as the downtown um, gets constructed. So we've looked at, um, re we've reviewed the smart, sorry, the design guidelines um, recently and kind of tweaked them a little bit. Um, zoning in and of itself is not enough. Like we understand that we need to be a partner in this. We need to continue to, to look at the zoning and tweak it and modify as downtown grows. We might have new requirements for applicants and developers. Um, we might relook at parking. Um, we're, we're an active, we're actively, we're not, you know, we're not just adopting zoning and sitting back and letting it happen, right? We are, we are watching it. We are monitoring it. We are evolving and responding to it. Um, we're looking at the, the needs of future residents, the infrastructure above ground and below ground. Um, and so tonight's workshop is focusing on, you know, a potential refresh to zoning um, that might happen you know, in this year, next year, um, sometime, sometime in the near future, right? Based on feedback we've heard and, and uh, things we're noticing as the town gets more built, right? So I had a couple of requests for a slide that kind of shows like the projects that we've approved and how they fit into these different focus areas that we're, that we're looking at tonight. So um, I, I put this slide together. Um, it's something that we can delve into more detail offline or um, in your breakout sessions. It's also a, a material that that's provided that you can look at. But this is this is a there's a lot of there's a, there's a few carrots at the bottom here and and notes. Not everything is like super neat and tidy in terms of how we calculate uh, lot coverage, open space, things like that. But we can get into that more later. Um, so tonight's focus areas we have three. Uh, lot coverage and dimensional re requirements, those two things need to kind of go hand in hand, right? Um, open space, greenery and pathways, um, another piece of the conversation, and parking requirements. Really quick, I'm going to just go through lot coverage. Um, so the things that we looked at, um, we looked at the zoning provisions. We have a couple maps looking at existing lot coverages by buildings um, and then breaking the lot coverage into uh, uh, intervals of like 10%. Um, and then I, I pr provided some materials for like an example to look at what, for an exercise to look at example lot coverages, locations and configurations. Um, and then we have, of course, considerations and questions. So these are all the things we've gathered here. As you can see, lot coverage is just one of many dimensional requirements. Um, and here's a map that shows the different um, percentages of lot coverage percentages for existing buildings. So the one where my cursor is, this is 30 Haven, um, and it's about 84%. And then Gold Street came in around 92%. Postmark's about 61. Um, Rise 475 right here is about 75%. So um, one of the caveats on my former slide is that like Postmark here has a little courtyard area, but it's raised and elevated and I believe and uh, David can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe underneath it, it's got some impervious, right? So it's um, it's part of the lot coverage, even though it is like a nice courtyard garden kind of green space amenity, it's actually part of the lot coverage calculation. So there's a lot of things like that with each development um, that we can parse out as we get more in, in depth in this conversation. Um, and then as I mentioned, breaking the lot coverage into different categories, right? So you can kind of see like which ones are, th these really dark buildings here are 81% um, or more in lot coverage. And then it gets, as they get lighter, it goes down, right? So the, the yellow ones are the lowest and those are less than 50% lot coverage. Um, all these materials are provided in the breakout session. So if you choose this one, you can look at them in more detail if you need. And I'll also be providing this uh, <laughs> presentation on the website after. So here's the exercise I put together just to show what a couple different lot coverages would look like on some different sites downtown. Um, again, you can get into some more detail in the lot coverage um, breakout session. And then some different locations like so, you know, the location of where you put the massing on the site is uh, a very important part of this conversation. Um, and, and then it also is an important part of the open space conversation as well, um, since they, they go hand in hand. 
um, considerations. So the definition of lot coverage that we have on the books right now um, doesn't include like pavement, right? So it just includes the area covered by the building. Um, so that's something we want to talk about. The location and relationship of lot coverage to other dimensional controls also um, important. There's a real interplay between lot coverage, setbacks, and height. Um, and then, like I mentioned, like where on site we want to encourage the massing of the building to be, and like where, which parts of the site do we want to free up to achieve the open space objectives. Um, so these are the questions, and these are questions we're going to go through in the breakout session. So I'm just going to blow through them real quick. Um, all right, and then going into open space, Andrew's going to take over. Um, and Andrew, just let me know, and I'll forward slides for you. Definitely. Thank you, Julie. So yes, as we get into open space, uh, the picture you see here is Elm Park, which is right at the edge of our downtown. It's actually one of my favorite spots in town with the benches and the shade trees and public art and little libraries. So I think it's something to strive for um, when we look at green space in our downtown. Uh, so if we can, Julie, we can just go right to the next slide. So similar to lot coverage, we looked at our current zoning provisions. What does our zoning bylaw have now um, versus other communities? We sampled another a number of other communities looking at both their 40R zoning bylaws and their design guidelines to kind of reference what they have, what we might be able to use from them and build oh. off of. Um, we also developed two maps that you'll see in just a few short slides that I can explain when we get there. And again, some specific considerations and questions that we would like to get your feedback on when we get to the breakout groups. Uh, next slide, please. So we looked at our zoning bylaw, like I said, uh, specifically our section 10.5, which is our downtown smart growth zoning district bylaw. Uh, right now, our zoning bylaw section 10.5 does not require open space in 40 r development. We do have a small clause in the bylaw, section 1059 that you see there um, that does discuss open space, but in all honesty, it's a bit boilerplate and I think could certainly be expanded if and when we continue this project. Uh, we also mention open space currently in our waivers. Uh, typically developments come in with the number of waiver requests from the lot coverage and dimensional aspects that Julie mentioned. And we have certain criteria to grant those waivers that we're looking for. And one of those happens to be publicly accessible open space. So um, that is certainly worth more discussion in the breakout groups and beyond and something we can look at again. We did look at our design guidelines, which again, in honesty, focus a lot on landscaping. Now there are provisions and language in there uh, describing connections and pathways to existing areas, but when we look at the other communities below, unlike them, we don't have a specific subsection for open space itself, like we do landscaping, like we do parking and signage and so on. Uh, so that's just another area of improvement that we could look at. Um, so next slide, please. So like I said, we sampled a number of other communities that we thought would be relevant. The first one was North Andover. Um, I very much like the term John used at the very beginning of tonight's meeting, and that's vibrancy. When we think North Andover, I think we think vibrant. They attract a lot of people both in and out of their community. We even used uh, their the yard example in development in the past um, when we were doing similar projects. So we looked at their zoning bylaw, their 40R bylaw is pretty strong. Um, they do require certain minimum space requirements of 15 to 20% in one of their smart growth districts, which is called the Osgood. Uh, they do separately define open space and recre recreational uses in their 40R bylaw, unlike ours, which is just in our normal definition section. Their design standards also address open space, like I had mentioned. And one caveat and one thing to note here is the language that we got this from of the minimum open space requirements of 15 to 20% was in their Osgood Smart Growth District. Now that district has since been repealed because there has been absolutely no development in it. And it's a bit unique that it was almost similar to our one general way more than our downtown where it was one big lot that they were looking at specific developers for a specific type of building and 
whatever reasons, they just didn't get it. So that has since been repealed in North Andover, but it doesn't mean that some of their language wasn't strong and that we couldn't use it. Uh, next slide, please. So we also looked at East Hampton, who was similar to Reading in terms of they allowed mixed use and 40 yard development in their downtown center with a main road like Route 28 going right through the center of it. Uh, they too provided a separate definition of open space and their design guidelines were very, very, very strong in my opinion, um, in terms of the language used regarding open space. So that is certainly something we can again build off of. Um, I've been in discussions with their planning department and I just at the end of today got some details on about two of their 40 r developments. So I'm still researching into that a bit as we continue this process. Um, we can go to the next slide. And then we also looked at Haverhill who also has a 40 r district with an MBTA commuter, commuter rail within it. Again, they define open space and recreational uses and specifically call them out in their 40 r bylaw that these are uses allowed by right. They also explicitly have the clause for density bonuses similar to our waiver language um, that if, a, if public amenities are provided, they can increase the density of a project. When we look at Haverhill though, the caveat and one thing to think of is they are looking at much larger lots and much larger development. You can see to the right here is uh, kind of their mill buildings and structures. These are uh, half acre or more lots that are seven plus stories. They allow up to 10 with those density bonuses. So it's just one thing to think about when we look at Haverhill and how they differ from Reading, though there's a lot, there's some similarities. It is a big difference as well in the open space that they develop. Um, versus when Julie mentioned our lots are a bit smaller in, in nature. So we can head on to the next slide. This was one of the maps that we developed, the spaces between. We really wanted to give an opportunity to just show existing building outlines and kind of use this map to get creative and where people and where you might think that open space would be a great fit and where it might go. So this map can be used to create connections between existing areas, develop new areas where you might want to see it uh, when we get into your breakout groups. And, you know, personally, I think it will be a great benefit. So we also developed a second map on the screen here, the open space greeneries and pathways, which shows public land, uh, public green space. So what you see is the green shading of the town common, Washington Park, and street trees. Um, it doesn't show private green space like green street uh, yards or anything like that, but that's something to note. And then we also tried to detail where some of the existing open spaces within a quarter mile to half mile of the downtown are. Julie's got her cursor on the Laurel Hill Cemetery, which is just north, same with Memorial Park and um, a few other parks east, west and south here, Washington Park. So. I know it's a bit hard to see right now, but when we get into your breakout groups, that will certainly be a good discussion as well. So when we're talking about open space, the considerations we want to have are, should we be separately defining this in our 40 r bylaw? And if we are, what should be included in that definition and what should be excluded? Should things like sidewalks with unobstructed views to the sky be uh, allowed to count as open space like some communities do, or should they not? Um, the location of open space, where do we want it? Where on the site does it make sense? If there's open space adjacent to it, we certainly want it to be contiguous with that. But then there's also unique ideas like green roofs or patio decks at the second level, and should those account for open space requirements? And then also the types and uses of open space. Do we want greenscape or hardscape like outdoor dining areas, pocket parks or pathways that connect to existing areas either in or outside of the downtown. And should these be active or passive uses like Elm Park, a bench and little library, or should it have a structure that somebody can play on and bring the family to and enjoy? Uh, and then the last consideration would be the public use of those private spaces and what those best practices are, because that can certainly be a bit tricky to manage and make it feel public when it's on private land. 
Uh, so we have three questions ready for the breakout groups that you can start thinking about now, those who are looking to join the open space group. First one is what constrains the creation of open space, things like prices of land, lot sizes, et cetera. So just be prepared for that and start thinking about that. Um, how do we envision these open spaces being used? Like I said, active or passive, um, what's going in it, what's not, what counts for it, what doesn't. And then third question is, are there other creative ways to achieve this vision at the lot level or beyond the individual lot, like creating those pathways to Washington Park and signage and all that. Um, so just food for thought for when we do get into the breakout groups and that is it, thank you. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm gonna try to be quick with parking, um, even though I know it's like a, a very hot, fun topic. Um, just go through what I have here. So we did similar, the information we looked at, um, zoning provisions, um, and then I did an analysis, which we call the parking shed, kind of like like watershed, but like basically the, the area that feeds into the municipal lots um, based on this exemption that we've had in zoning since 1962 that, uh, that enables um, retail office and um, consumer service uh, types of uses to be exempt from providing parking on their own sites if they're within 300 feet of a municipal lot. So we kind of examined the burden over time on uh, two of the municipal lots, the CVS and the Brandy Court lot. Um, and then the utilization data for multifamily and mixed use buildings downtown. So like um, the parking that they're providing on site, uh, whether their um, residents are actually using it or not. Um, and then we have considerations and questions. So I'll just go through it really quick. Um, so I mentioned the zoning provision just now, we've had since 1962, this exemption for um, certain types of commercial. And then we um, actually added to it in 20, uh, 2009 when we adopted the downtown smart growth district by adding restaurant uses into it. So um, restaurant uses within 300 feet of a municipal lot no longer require parking um, and then other non-residential uses as well. So. Um, again, like the shed analysis, um, I examined the burden over time on municipal lots in terms of the gap between private parking provided on the site and what the zoning requirement would, would be, right? So, and I looked at three intervals, um, even though it's been on the books since the 60s, I, I only went back to 2000. Um, that's the available data I had um, in this time frame to get it ready for tonight. So I looked at 2000 to 2010, 2010 to 2020, and 2020 and beyond, right? Um, some caveats to the analysis um, before I unveil the key takeaways. Um, the gap um, that I mentioned above doesn't account for shared parking, hours of use of the different businesses, or any nuances of how a site and business function, right? It's really just a raw number, like what does zoning require and what's provided, right? And what's that gap? Um, and then um, the burden was determined based on requirements, not on demand or utilization. So those can vary widely. So you might have one retail use that's like not very popular and doesn't generate a lot of parking demand. No one's visiting it. It goes out of business and is replaced with another retail use that's extremely popular. And there's a ton of cars come into town for it, right? But they're both retail uses and they're, they both have the same parking requirement and they're actually still both exempt from providing it, right? So, um, the key takeaways from the um, analysis are that the gap and the burden are increasing over time. That's really not super surprising uh, to me. I was kind of going into the analysis thinking that might be the case. Um, I apologize in advance for this map, but if you can stomach this, you'll be able to stomach the next one even better. And I'm just going to quickly, <laughs> this is basically like, this is the Brandy Court lot, um, and this is the 300 foot buffer around it. It's this black line. Um, there are 95 parking spaces in the lot. There are 54 parcels within 300 feet of the lot. 26 are zone business B um, with the downtown smart growth district overlay. I focused on the, the, those 26 um, and I weeded out all the ones where there was no change in the uses um, or no additional commercial square footage added since 2000, right? Um, like no, no change in the use categories, right? So maybe it re went retail to retail. So people remember there used to be this store and now there's this other store, like that's considered like no change in this analysis, right? Um, and so I, I was able to whittle it down to these, these five properties that have either had an expansion in commercial square footage or a change um, in how they're used over time, um, or they were just fully redeveloped. And the gap here is shown in red 
increasing over time. And the ratio also, you can see, uh, gets pretty off the hook. Um, OK, moving along, I like I said, sorry about this slide. Um, <laughs> so this is a focus on the CVS lot, which I outlined the 30 foot, sorry, 300 foot radius around in black. All these other like circles are uh, 300 foot radiuses around other municipal lots. I just kind of want to see what the overlap was and it's visually really, really crazy. Um, anyway, so again, CVS has about 58 parking spaces in the lot um, that are town owned. Um, there's a little error here up here. Um, so don't look at that. I just drew your attention to it. Um, there are 43 parcels within 300 feet of the lot, 35 are zoned for this view of the downtown smart growth district overlay. So I did the same kind of analysis, um, commercial square footage, parking, um, and look, looking at the gap. And again, the gap has increased and the burden has increased over time. And we can get into more detail in these in the breakout session. Um, okay, utilization data for the multifamily mixed use buildings downtown. Um, I reached out to owners and managers of 13 of these properties. They all got back to me, which was amazing. Um, and I got the data in different formats. Um, I, I got, I think I got about five or six in the format that I wanted it in. It's a work in progress. Um, I'm having an ongoing dialogue with, with these owners um, to, to get it in, in a format that I can like really in, analyze it. Um, but the takeaways so far, um, over three quarters of residents in one bedroom units have zero or one car. Uh, over three quarters of residents in two bedroom units have one to two cars, some have three. Um, parking demand is higher in for sale projects. So those are three key takeaways for right now. Um, and we'll dig into that in more detail when I can get the data um, the way that I need it. And then we can look into right sizing and whether it makes sense to adjust uh, requirements for residential parking um, up or down based on the utilization of the sites downtown. And again, like some of the properties aren't uh, completed or fully occupied yet. So like I'll, we'll know a lot more um, in the next probably years, year or two um, about this. Considerations um, to reiterate residential, adjusting the ratio based on per bedroom utilization, um, visitor parking, how do we wanna handle loading areas? Loading's kind of shifted, it's like smaller vehicles more frequently, uh, at least that's my, my perception. Um, commercial, uh, do we wanna require spaces for the commercial uses? Do we wanna eliminate the exemption for uses within 300 feet of a municipal lot? Um, and again, like how do we wanna handle loading? And then, of course, when we talk about parking, we can't forget other modes. Um, walking, biking, uh, car share, EV charging, like there's a lot of other things that should be included in the conversation about parking. So we're not just designing for the vehicle all the time. All right. And then three questions. These are like basically the questions I just mentioned. Um, and we can we can get into them in the breakout session. And that's it from me. So um, what, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the screen share really quick. And then Andrew's going to enable the breakout session. So you'll see a little box pop up on your screen. And you can pick which of the three focus areas you want to enter into. Um, we will be allocating about 40 minutes um, for the session. And yeah, you can just pick the one you're interested in and we will all basically what will happen is once you select it, you'll be put into a different zoom room with all the other people on the call that are interested in that topic. And you'll be with a CPDC facilitator, two CPDC facilitators and a staff person and we will help you. We will have all the materials for you. So when you see that pop up, please choose your own adventure. and We will see you in a little while. Any second now. Andrew, I'm not actually seeing a choice. Oh, never mind.
have the choices been posted? Yeah, so what I see on my screen is actually a list of everyone on the call. Um, and at the top, it's unassigned and it's a list. And so if you just um, scroll down, you'll see the other choices and you can choose which one to go into. I didn't realize it was gonna show up this way and I don't know if it does for everybody. No, I just see names and photographs. Okay. If um, you click on click on the breakout rooms icon at the bottom that's there now, and then you get, I see the list of names and the choices. I'm not getting that. I don't see that either. It might be under more. Do you see there? Under what? Under more, there's three dots in the more, and then you should see a section for breakout rooms, hopefully. No. No. Interesting. Participants, chat, share screen, record, and reactions. And then, of course, mute, you know. Um, I, can I can assign everyone to a room if you have a specific one you would like to, or I can randomly assign everybody in the thing. Can you but tell I, us again what they are? Right. I have the lot coverage and dimensional requirements, open space, or parking. How do we? Uh, I'd like to be in lot coverage. Okay. Hmm. Let me see if I can get this coverage. Steven, we will get you in parking. Tony, we will do not. All right, Andrew, are you good if I go into my parking session? I believe so. Hmm? Okay, all right. Um, and so we'll plan to meet back at, let's say it's like 8.50. Um, Just about 9.30. Hmm? It's about 9.30, we'll meet back, yeah. Okay. All right, great. Um, if anyone else has a room they would specifically like to see, please let me know, shout it out, put it in the chat. Joe George likes will, parking. Yep, George will get you to parking. Thomas will get you to parking. I'll do that right now. Who would like to go to parking? David, you got it. Does anybody else have a specific room or I will assign you randomly? I'm still, Joan is still in the large group. Do you have a specific group you'd like to join, Joan? Yeah, parking. Parking, you got it. Anybody else? Yes, please. Um, it's Rick Wetzler. I'm just going to switch to my desktop, but I would prefer open space, please. You got it. I'll fill you in. I think I have to go back out through the uh, foyer and, and back in when I log into my laptop. Okay, so, if you do, I'll keep my eye out for you and get you into yeah. open space. Wonderful. Thank you very much. No problem. I'll go wherever you need me. I, that was my husband, so I guess he, I open space. Would okay. What was he doing, lot coverage? I believe he was doing open space as well. Oh, well, I could do lot coverage then. Okay, you got it. Mm -hmm.
Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, but you know, this is, that same issue has been going on uh, since the you know '60s and '70s, um, or same you know concern right about how much is the town providing for parking uh, for town businesses versus um, how much parking are they providing themselves. So, anyways, just an interesting aside as I as we gather here. Um, I am going to uh, share my screen. Uh, right, these are the um, the the items that um, that Julie went over. Right, that we we really um, would love to get some some feedback on. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, how much deeper, right, if, if people have questions on anything that Julie went over, um, if people have, have thoughts on what's happening downtown in terms of uh, parking and parking demand. Um, but, you know, these came up um, really because, you know, they're, they're the things that uh, CPDC has seen as, um, as issues, as we've seen developments. Um, you know, come in and we've re reviewed them. You know, uh, how do how do these developments deal with visitor parking and loading? Um, you, you know, and and it's it's always on it, right? It's a case by case basis, and um, you know, um, I'm not quite sure whether whether um, we are addressing those things. You know, the the best the best way. Uh, we talked some about the the commercial um, the the commercial um, space requirements um you know loading for commercial businesses certainly is always is always an issue um with with how that's done and sort of the what kind of restrictions we we put on those um so i i guess I, i'm gonna I, i'm gonna flip forward a little bit um and then um to this to some of these analyses um, I think this is the one to me that's the most interesting um, to, to start off with. Um, I, I don't know, you know, if people have been uh, in town here for uh, that are in this group for, for a while, but if people were um, around when, you know, when this used to be the Atlantic supermarket. Um, uh, but right, the use of, of that lot when it was the Atlantic uh, was dramatically different than the use uh, the the use now, right? Uh, lots of turnover, always full, lots of turnover. Um, I, I guess the thing that I think is is important that we also think about um, using this as the example is that you know if we look at the um, the pre two thousand square footage of, of, you know, commercial square footage, which was about 60,000 square feet, um, which included the Atlantic supermarket. Um, and then we jump forward to, you know, 2020 and beyond. Um, we are now only at uh, 68,000 uh, square feet. So not dramatically different in this parking area shed. Um, uh, and although because of the square footage, um, right, this gap analysis shows that there's not quite, you know, that the gap is widening between what uh, businesses are providing and what is, is needed um, or, or what is needed per our zoning. Um, but I guess my impression, and maybe people have other impressions, is that this Brandy Court lot is used dramatically dramatically less now than it was back when there was less commercial development. Um, and, you know, please correct me if, if you have a different impression, uh, but it sort of goes to me that goes to, to, to the point that to, goes to show that we, I think we need to look at things a little bit differently, perhaps than just based on square footage, right? It, the, the use matters. I, I guess is a long-winded way of say, of saying that, um, but uh, that's just my thoughts. I, I really would love to hear from other people. 
either on that or other parking issues. Do I understand you correctly that you're saying that the Brandy Court lot is not being used very much? Uh, I'm saying in comparison to how it was used when uh, the Atlantic supermarket was there. Hmm. Do, you, do you think that's not accurate? I haven't used it a whole lot lately, but um, I did go down to use the, to, to um, get some Thai food one day and there was no parking on Haven because of all the construction at the sites around. I understand mm -hmm. that. And I went to Brandy Court and it was full. I almost had to park illegally to pick up my supper. Um, but I, and I have a feeling that maybe because of the postmark and the Gould Street you know, construction, the construction workers are everywhere. So I'm sure that that's part of the, the reason that was full. John, I, this is David Zeke. I'd like to make a comment about that. You know, when, when the when the supermarket was there, it was the supermarket, right? I mean, we didn't have stop and shop and we didn't have market basket. And so the lot of, lot of traffic was going there in and out. So this was in and out traffic yep. downtown. Uh, that's that's not what's going on down there right now. I mean, the the, the businesses on on Woburn are very kind of uh, boutique specialized businesses. They don't they don't attract that kind of traffic. But I think that's a good a good um, way to look at the problem. And when we talked about earlier about doing things like putting an entertainment value down uh, venue mm -hmm. downtown. That's the kind of thing would create a lot of traffic, say uh, after hours, or or um, if we have something that's that's a draw like that, you know, then then I then I really like the model of of large lots on the periphery of the downtown area and minimizing the actual on street parking. I mean, turning the places like Haven Street, you know, into a lot more pedestrian bike uh, kind of traffic, take out a lot of the diagonal parking. And rely on these lots that are right that are right on the periphery, and to the extent that they're there, you know, allowing longer term parking um, in those in those lots. I mean, the, the closer you get into the center of town, the, the shorter the parking you know would be allowed. Now, I'm I'm one of those people who lives now in the postmark, so you know I get to see how it how it's developing down there with the with the traffic in the area, but. But I don't. I wouldn't compare what's happening right now in the Brandy Court lot to what was going on when the Atlantic was there, because I think that's a different use case, and I think yeah. you identified it. I'd like to make a comment, if I could. Yeah, please do. Um, I I, I want to uh, bring everyone's attention to something that happened in the neighboring town, over in uh, Wakefield when they built the brand new CVS on Main Street next to the American Civic Center. That <clears throat> store was gasping for oxygen and almost failed because they didn't have adequate parking around it. They had a giant parking lot right next, almost right next to the building, adjacent to the American Civic Center. And they did a, 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 an analysis and they found that people, if they couldn't park within 80 to 120 feet from the front door of the store, they went by, they didn't stop. Um, to the point where CBS actually bought the brick building behind their store, which was an old Verizon <laughs> building. They tore the building down and created a parking lot so their customers could park there. And then the store became successful. It was not successful until they created parking. A lot of the things that have been talked about as, um, improvements to downtown Reading, um, you know, for people to come and visit. You're gonna have the same problem with that in downtown Reading. Um, just because you create it, that doesn't mean they're gonna come. If people can't park and park close to where they're going in downtown Reading for some of these places that you might develop as new features for downtown Reading, it's not gonna work unless you have parking. The other thing I'd also like to mention is as the postmark and perhaps some of the the, uh, uh, the uh, commercial space in postmark and also um, the new building that is on Gould Street as that becomes uh, fully developed out and you have more traffic from that you're going to start filling up the, the parking lot that is the old um, uh, Randy Court lot which was where 
um, uh, Kent Lanik was. So uh, many of these ideas sound, they sound great in theory, but if you don't solve your parking problem, they're not going to work. Completely agree. Yep. Parking is a is a big driver and and a big um, uh, a big restriction on uh, on development. Um, you know, absolutely. I have a question. Uh, sure. uh, first of all, a, a clarification. My name is George McHugh. Uh, I'm going through some therapy right now, so I have a very limited voice, and I'll try and limit my words. Uh, first of all, I wanted to point out, I couldn't agree with Mr. Panette more. His point on, I've seen this in other communities, um, in Brookline, where I own some, some properties, um, uh, just for the record and clarification, I'm the president of a property management firm uh, primarily in the Brookline, Cambridge area, um, but also in some suburban areas where we don't have a lot of this problem, but anywhere where you're dealing with large populations and the density that, that we're starting to see here, um, the parking becomes uh, critical to the uh, success of our commercial businesses. And in the case of me personally, I have to know 21 Sanborn Street here. Uh, it's critical for me to be able to have access for parking for my residents because it's, you know, I bought a building without parking. Uh, and it's my biggest concern. So, you know, uh, conversations about losing spaces, I think really, uh, you know, have to be looked at um, in totality um, of what you're going to be doing with the business community. Um, it's great to talk about, you know, bike paths and all this stuff. And, and I'm all for charging stations and things like that. That's wonderful. It should be properly located. Um, but we, our parking spaces are critical to the business community. And I wouldn't want to lose one for some of the things we're talking about. With that, I don't think you'll hear from me again tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your input. Um, yeah, so <laughs> parking, uh, you know, parking's an a interesting thing. Um, you know, certainly when we, um, when the, the, the first version of the downtown smart growth, um, you know, was, was drafted and, and the 1.25, um, you, uh, parking spots per, per residential unit was, was established. We, we did see that as a, as a, um, uh, part of the way that development um, would be metered, right? Because parking, uh, uh, parking, you know, would be required for that, and and will, would would drive that. Um, and you know, and that and that really has has played out, right? It is that those those spaces where um, where a development can accommodate. Um, you know, uh, structured parking um, is has been able to to go forward, and as Julie pointed out, you know the 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 trick the the issue with with Reading downtown is um, is really how small all of our uh, you know all all the parcels are. Um, you know, just looking on at this at this graphic, um, you know, there's some there's a uh, very few large parcels um, where you can develop and also get on street parking. I mean, on site, uh, on site parking. Um, so, you know, that um, I, I, I um, you know, the on site parking is probably what's needed right now for that ground floor retail. And so if you were to do anything more on some of these, these sites, like add, more residential like has been done on on some of these right you would need to have um, additional additional structured parking um, so I certainly see that parking is is key to um, 
to 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 the ability to de to develop some of these partials. Um, and so the the question really the question at hand is do we have it right um, you know do we have the is the 1.25 um, uh, spaces per per unit the the right thing um, you know should we be um, are there um, are is loading for downtown working um, um, you know, do we, because we, I'll say generally um, in the, you know, the developments that have, have um, advanced over the past decade, um, you know, certainly in downtown, I, I, Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think any of them have, have loading zones. Um, we have generally uh, uh, waived that requirement. Um, in, there are a couple. Um, Rise 475 provided it um, in their parking lot. Um, oh, that's right. Yes. The Ace Flats did as well. Um, and then the Reading Village 40B, which didn't come to CPDC, but went to zoning board, um, has on site loading as well. But it is tricky for many projects to figure out how to accommodate that. Uh, Mr. Right. Chairman? Sure. Mr. Stefan uh, Weisnick. Uh, would like to make a comment? Sure. It's uh, Wayness, but uh, I forgive you. I, I know it's a, it's a crazy name to uh, pronounce. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I made a, a, a bit of a case uh, before the breakout room about parking. And, you know, I, I think the thing that makes this particular exercise hard is that we're really in a very strange, um, uh, you know, the pandemic is really kind of thrown off our experiences over the past year. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to think back, oh, you know, last year, how is parking working? How is it not working? And, you know, I'm not coming up with a whole lot of um, uh, frame of reference. So I find it really hard to say, you know, you've got this 10 year, period from, you know, 2000 to 2010, 2010 to 2020, and then 2020 on. I mean, it's just, it's hard for me to say whether or not we're really doing this the right way. Now, that being said, we are talking about a downtown. You know, we're not talking about a green field, you know, suburbia. We're talking about like the center of Reading. So, I mean, it stands to reason that you're going to have a different kind of parking requirement in the downtown of Reading. And I think it makes sense that you're going to have less of it because, you know, square footage is more of a premium when you, when you're at a high, more highly developed area. And, you know, back to the point about CVS and Wakefield. Yeah. I mean, I also lived in Wakefield while that was all going on and I think that what you see there is actually the private market solving its own problem. You know, a CVS was getting, you know, not the traffic it wanted, so it bought up another lot and just paved it over. So, I mean, I don't know how much of a, a zoning is involved with that, but I mean, I think that what we're trying to do is we're trying to give the incentives that for downtown Reading developments that you know, we have the central municipal lot, and then we have a discussion on, on the public spaces. You know, it just, I don't know. I, so it's it's hard for me to really address this with the uh, the past year, the COVID, the COVID pandemic. And I, and I think it's really worth coming back to it, maybe when we can say what is normal again. Yeah, it, th that's fair. And, and I guess, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, we on the on CBDC have have uh, right. We always talk about parking because it's hard. It's hard not to um, ha have part of that discussion. But you know, with all of these developments that are downtown that are now coming in, to, you know, sort of coming into um, uh, completion, and more people are are living in them, including David here, right? 
um, the, you know, it's, it's hard to know. I think it's hard to know right now how that's all going to play out and how it's going to feel. And then you layer on top the, you know, the pandemic, we really have no idea how it's going to feel when it, when we all come out of it. And, and our feeling is that, you know, uh, right. I, if, if this was a perfect world, I'd put off this discussion until, you know, for another year or two, but, you know, things keep moving. And so we can't do that. And, and I guess really what, what, why, why we're looking at these three things, right? Open space and lot coverage and parking is because, you know, looking at, um, you know, looking at, at this, I'll, uh, I'll refer back to this, um, to this graphic here, right? Um, or, or maybe, uh, maybe this one is, is better where you see the building footprints, right? Um, and so if the, and right, this is this is a good one because you see the building footprints and then you see the parking, right? And if the desire, as what was said, is at, at town meeting was if the desire is more for more um, more open space, I, the question is um, really how does that how is that open space used? How is the space used that the building isn't on? And right, the biggest demand I think everyone. Um, it basically said that that's on this in this group is it right the the biggest demand is parking um, for use for that other space on the on the lot and the question really comes um, I think is really why we lumped all this together is you know if we then allocate some of some of these spaces right that are shown here as parking let's take this for example this office building right if some of that is m required more for for open space, that means that the owner is going to use it less for less for parking, and then there's a, a smaller you know developable area for for the building, and you know maybe that's good, maybe it's maybe it's not, but right that does impact the viability of of some um, additional investments in in town. Um, so that's why that's why they're all, I'm sorry that's why they're all linked together and why we felt like we needed to talk to talk about all three right because the interplay between them I'm sorry go ahead that's okay so for clarification we've got the open space committee and then we've got the parking committee and are you saying and this is dumbing it down a little bit that we could potentially be vying for the same plots in parking lots such as the office building that you just had trying to force that building to have open space which would reduce their parking which goes against what we're trying to do or am i misinterpreting that uh right, you, no you're not entirely okay. <laughs> misinterpreting right there's only so much land right there's only right, right. there's right. only so much land in downtown i think as right. you said that that you know we we have a pretty small downtown in terms of acreage um, and so anything, right, anything else that we try and fit on these lots means something has else, to go. It, something has to go. Um, and um, yeah, that's the, that's the, the, oh. the truth of it. So Julie, um, last year when we talked parking, um, we had had a conversation about the behind 30 Haven and you were going to try and figure out how many parking spaces were under the building that the residents used and how many spaces in the lot did they use? Did you ever like figure that out? Yeah, I did. Um, so I'm in a dialogue with the um, own property manager, owner of that site. Um, they have 78 spaces in the garage there and um, they 10 are dedicated to the, actually the commercial spaces. Um, there's, I think there's five commercial spaces and you each get two spots each. Um, and then that leaves 68, some for the residents. Um, I'm still working to kind of get a breakdown to determine of those 68, like how many are actually used by residents. Um, and 68 like also includes um, some handicapped spaces and, and um, potentially some visitor spaces as well. So I'm, I'm still working on getting more fine-grained information, but um, actually I can see. Because my, uh, my thought is the, the lot that's going, the building that's going in the EMARC lot 
you know, there's all those discussions at the meetings about the parking there, and it's very tight under there for parking. And I'm wondering if potentially the same thing could happen there, or do they, because are they deeded spaces under that building or? No, and that's a really good, that's a good um, point that you're making. So we typically recommend that developers like unbundle the parking from the units, right? So it's not like you sign a lease for a unit and it comes with a space automatically um, that like, because people might move in that don't need parking spaces. Um, right. That gives you like a more real sense of like what the parking demand and, and utilization will be. Um, and so we only have a couple properties downtown where they actually, the spaces are actually um, bundled or deeded or um, allocated. Um, many, most of them do not do it that way. Um, and so when Ace Flats, like the developer there is um, gathering, like he will be gathering the data that I need um, to add in my spreadsheet once that building starts becoming occupied. Um, and I think their goal is if they do want more spaces, they would be available to um, like someone who works in the commercial space. And I guess when, when let's say I go rent an apartment or I buy an, a condo, and they say you can, you know, if they unbundle it, you can have a space here. I'm curious what they actually tell their residents about where they could park if they're not going to take a space under the building. Can they say we well, can just grab a space anywhere, or, you know, does that do they then send them to the police station to get a parking sticker to be able to park in the lot overnight? You know what I mean? Like that. Some people may choose not to take the parking with the building because it costs them more money. So right. I do think we have like this. It, we're not really here tonight to talk about regulations, but I do think we have some restrictions on overnight parking that would. Make okay. It yeah, no, I wasn't talking about restrictions. I'm just trying yeah. to think of different places where we might end up losing more general parking spaces with the things that are about to become populated. So we don't really know what the parking is going to be when the EMARC building's full and while all these. So we could have. Not only are we fighting with our open space people, but we're fighting with people that aren't even living here yet. And we're not gonna know what that is till they occupy the buildings. Yeah. yeah. Right. So fair statement. Um I guess I can speak from um I live on Linden Street and I used to take the train to work every day. And I know that before COVID hit, um, there was a lot of parking on my street from people that took the train. So I think that, uh, but there's been nobody parking on my street for a year because even the construction guys are all parking downtown. And now that the, now that the projects are kind of resolving, I find that there's a lot more space downtown. I think the parking, um, I think part of the issue downtown with parking and employees might lighten up a little bit because they're not quite sure whether the T will become fully populated again because so many people are working remotely and they're not quite sure. So as far as residents parking or visitors parking downtown and taking up those spaces, I think that's a big question mark right now. Um, but for the, for the businesses, I don't know if anyone on this meeting in this section is, owns a business downtown, but um, I think it's got to be really hard for someone like the dog store who has two spaces in front of her store and, and, you know, people park there all day to go into the dentist office or something. So I think that, um, but I agree with what somebody said, where if you can't park right in front, you're going to go someplace else. Like there's four CVSs that I could go to without even blinking an eye. And, you know, I can go to four different dog stores, you know, bigger chains and, we really want to support our businesses. So we're in a really tough situation for trying to support the local businesses and not make it harder for them to provide parking for their customers um, by changing regulations that we probably need to change change or make, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know how, how this is easily going to be solved without knocking down a building and putting up a parking garage, which isn't going to happen. Could I add one more comment? Sure, please do. Um, well, one thing that, um, John, when you were talking about, you know, doing your historical research on the parking issue, you came up with a starting point in 1960, and I, you know, that kind of stuck in my head because the way parking has been used 
has been a way that reinforces social inequity. And like thinking about, you know, whenever we talk about urban renewal and that sort of thing, like, you know, the highways, people before highways. Now, I know that's far away from what we're discussing here right now, but I think that we should really be aware and be cognizant that in some of the ways that we talk about parking and making the requirements has an institutional effect on the kind and a, of people that are able to enjoy um, the, the public spaces just as much as everyone else. And really what it comes down to is that, you know, there it, it's racism that's baked in there and it's hard to disentangle. And I'm not saying that we're, you know, I'm not saying that we're perpetuating a, a, a racial um, thing here, but we have to be aware that by um, spending so much effort and trying to um, focus so much on parking that oftentimes people are unconsciously biased that parking is turning into like a social, um, like a, a, a social inequity sort of thing. And we should just be, be careful of it. I know we're not gonna solve that now. That's a big, much bigger conversation. But it's interesting that parking really started taking off during the 1960s when it was the dawn of the civil rights era. And if you look into the history, that's part of the change of racial um, conversation was that instead of talking explicitly about racism, they would talk more about the uh, social, uh, socioeconomic status. So we just have to be careful. Yep, understood. And and I think some of the things that we're we're doing, like Julie mentioned, about trying to to um, you know work with developers to untangle um, you know uh, parking with um, you know uh, with the units, and so that right that parking requirement, the the cost of the units don't um, don't escalate up for those people that don't you know that don't necessarily want or need a car and. Um, you know, and, and some of those things to untangle, um, you know, can be done to untangle the that car centric um, need. So, or, or thing that we've we've built in here. Um, so, I, I guess I I really I um, <laughs> Julie um, would not be pleased, right, if I didn't at least focus some on these on these questions. Um, and um, uh, um, you know, I think to, to help us, um, you know, move along on, on some of these issues, um, you know, do you have any thoughts, does anyone have any thoughts on whether, um, whether we should think about um, eliminating or modifying that commercial uh, exemption? And, and I'll, I'll say that, you know, in the last uh, Julie had had mentioned that we had been um, uh, changing some of the um, design guidelines, and one of the things that we we are trying to urge developers is to instead of just saying, "Yeah, we're exempt because of this 300 feet," um, but to actually provide data on you know who the develop you know who the users of the space are and how those how. Uh, what the timing is and what the demand they're going to place on those municipal lots. Um, what we have sort of found is that that's difficult in the in the way that um, uh, developments happen because they don't necessarily know who that user, who that retailer is going to be that's going to go in there, and their 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 parking demand may be be different, you know, depending on who the retailer. Um, who the retailer is, um, and so that's a little bit hard. But um, but I, I don't know if anyone has thoughts on on that. that so, if, so if you were to eliminate the commercial exemption, and I'm only going to use the dog store and like the dentist office as two examples because they're so far apart from one another as far as size and who goes there. Like, how would that impact each of them? if you did that, because they basically use the same lot if there's nothing available in front. So how would that impact each of them? 
Well, so I don't think it would impact um, it. It wouldn't impact those businesses, right? They're there and they're, I, I don't think that the discussion is about doing away with the exemption for existing buildings. Okay. But, um, but if we, if that exemption didn't exist when the 30 Haven building was built, then what they, what the 30 Haven building developer would have had to have done is, is figured out how they can accommodate um, a, a number of additional parking spaces on the lot or reduce their overall demand. Um, and so how, how would you do that, right? The lot's only as big. So that means that the development would decrease. Um, or I, I'm, I'm not sure I have, or, or maybe be lower or smaller on that particular parcel. It wouldn't have ever been smaller because the parking lot, the, right. the, the basement was there that they used as a parking lot, so right. a parking structure. And so it would have meant that the parking, the, the building would have been smaller, right? Cause they would have had to, they would only have those, how many spaces are down there, Julie? 75? 78. So they would have only been able to accommodate um, really, right. really, um, if we play that development out, I'm gonna guess that, um, that we, that that building would never have been able to be anything more than the Atlantic, you know, the one story Atlantic supermarket size, right? Because you would have out one per 300 square feet, then, you know, that's maybe, maybe we could have gotten another, another story, but so that's, I mean, that's the extreme, uh, right? That's, that's the extreme. But, so then if you take it into reality now and you eliminate it for future, um, you know, I don't even know if you can, because where are they going to park? You know, if somebody moves into where the dry cleaner was down on Haven and you tell them that you get two spaces in front of your store as, as your allotted spaces, that happened to the bakery, actually, when there was a bakery, patrons don't care where they park. They'll just park anywhere. So I mean, you know, if the, if the bakery used to think that they had the spaces in front of them and they were always full from people going to the hair salon and and the, the store doesn't have any control over where I'm going to go park. Right. You know, I, I think that's, I think that's kind of central to what we're talking about, especially. So as I understand it, you know, the vision of how downtown businesses would uh, exist in, in the 40 yard development, the smart growth area is kind of different from the strip mall, you know, model that we've been using. And, um, you know, it, we've got a plan for, We've got a plan for the whole area. We've got a plan parking as a as a downtown problem, not as a problem for a store owner and the you know the two or three spaces that might exist in front of his you know, in front of his business. As as Karen says, the store doesn't really know whether anybody's going the right people are going to use those three spaces anyway. But but we don't want to. I don't think we want to have a, a a business plan or a town plan that's kind of focused on on uh, that kind of, um, you know, one store, one, one parking spot kind of model. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to think about how we can get a lot more people going to these businesses uh, that's, not, that's not that localized, you know, that's not that parochial. You know, it's something that says, how can, how can we park them close enough that they, they will go, that they are right. interested in going? Right. Or we, don't get, or we don't get more use out of those businesses. So, I mean, that's it, you know, or, or we're, or we just go back to build the Atlantic again, right? Because that's the only thing that it's worked there. So, so I, I think it's a lot more. I think it's a lot more difficult than than how do we get parking for a particular new business? Whether that's, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure a bookstore has a lot less, you know, you know, drive, uh, you know, drive up and hop in uh, business than than maybe than some of the, the nail salons or something. It's, it's an entirely different model for a customer. 
and we can't anticipate that. We need to anticipate it from a larger view. I will. I, I will say, I recall um, this is years back, right? And um, I don't know if the folks remember there was a vacuum cleaner store uh, right on Main Street uh, where the um, a vacuum cleaner repair store on Main Street where the uh, Havana Sushi is now. Um, and someone we were talking with the, someone and they were like, well, that that poor store owner, they don't have any parking for um, for for, uh, for that for their customers to drop their their vacuum cleaners off. And I remember thinking, well, gee, that may have not been the greatest location decision for that for that business owner because parking in that area hasn't changed in you know they're in forever. Um, and so, you know, to, I think why I'm saying that is, you know, there are businesses that that um, that can thrive in a place where they don't necessarily need to have, you know, customers j jump out of their car, you know, 10 feet away. Um, and, and maybe that is what we, we need to be thinking about driving. Uh, that was a bad word. <laughs> uh, uh, coming into Reading in these spaces than the ones that necessarily need the, 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 the parking demand right out in front. Um, oh, we have uh, one minute. I feel like we just got started. Yeah. It was a really good conversation. I think that it's, I really appreciate everybody pulling this meeting together and breaking it out and can I leave a, a thought with everyone that's in this uh, in this uh, window? Sure, please do. Big elephant in the room. Take a look at the Walgreens store. And just think about what's happening there. Yeah, I, I will say that what's happening at Walgreens has nothing to do with anything, any rational business decision, yeah. right? That's a that's a corporate issue right. um, that isn't drive, driven by any any anything that's happening in Reading. One of the biggest problems they had there is parking. Get cut off. Sorry, John. Jonathan, <laughs> said we get cut. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Hope it was productive and exciting. Extremely. Can't wait to hear about it. We ran out of spaces for all of our stickies. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Um, so this is the report out um, part of the workshop. So I think we should just start like in the order we were in um, with lot coverage, the lot coverage group. Um, Nick, I don't know if you want to share your um, Google Jamboard with everyone or if you have a spokesperson. Um, I can summarize it. <laughs> Uh, first, I wanted to thank everybody who who joined that Jamboard. The discussion was great, and it, you know it was positive, Super. which is really nice. Um, but basically, it, it looks like there's a there's a desire for some increased setbacks or decreased lot coverage, right? Uh, impacting grade. So, whatever the definition is, you know, of lot coverage, typically it's the building. Those breaks, those uh, breaks in math, those setbacks have should happen at grade so that there's some usable space there, not just say some raised level, uh, you know, only open to say the residents of a particular building or, um, so looking looking at setting setbacks uh, and lot coverage, I mean, you know, some numbers were thrown out. We really don't understand every single lot, um, but a, a significant setback in some areas to create something usable. And anybody else who was in that Jamboard can certainly speak up. We um, parking, oh. much parking um, requirement for the residential stuff and, and some portion for the commercial as well. And uh, we also talked about um, some great spaces downtown for entertainment, things like that, green spaces, 
making things more aesthetically pleasing with the cuts inside into the buildings and and the whole like trying to get um the law coverage to be written in the bylaw uh, not in the bylaws in the design guidelines to be less than 100 percent um yeah and with more buildings coming online, um, 100% lot coverage does not seem appropriate. It, it uh, needs to be less than 100%. How much less? You can clearly, you can't combine lots, existing lots to make larger lots and preventing the acquisition of residential lots that we have today and getting zoning variances to expand the, 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 the district, so to speak. So Nick, good, is, that a, is that a good summary? Is that? Yeah, I think that's, right. that's most of the points. All right, great. All right, great. Next up is open space. Um, Heather, do you want to? Yes, and I, I want to thank my, I want to thank the open space group as well. That was really good energy, really good ideas. I'm going to be challenged to have my summary be as concise as next. So um, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go through some high points and I am confident that I'm not going to capture in my summary everything because another thing that was neat was that there were very few repeated ideas. Um, but on there were some good comments, many good comments on what's cons what's constraining the creation of op open space, things like the realities that developers want to maximize the revenue that they can get from a piece of land, uh, and that we perhaps don't have strong enough design guideline language or bylaws uh, to really push the creation of open space, that proper maintenance of open space is always a challenge, and frankly, pavement and concrete and the existence of pavement and concrete where we might otherwise prefer open space is a challenge right there. Lots of ideas uh, were given for how we envision using open space, walking, running, art, culture, uh, serene enjoyment, socialization. People were talking about the idea of having a green bell that connects to other areas of town and even to other open space areas of other towns like Lake Pornipowit. Um, another idea for uses of open space was to center the open space in the downtown Smart Growth District to kind of integrate it with commercial uses, especially if it's a place where you might want to go meet up with a friend and have a beer or have a coffee or have a snack to bring that all together in our downtown smart growth district. Somebody also mentioned um, wanting, uh, would love to see fountains and water features as well. There were lots of ideas for, and creative ideas for how to generate the kind of open space that folks here would like to see in the downtown smart, smart growth district. Um, sidewalk enhancements, um, you know, maybe pushing developers to widen, to, to widen sidewalks as part of their project, uh, to have, sorry here, I'm, I'm glancing at everything at the same time. Um, there was a lot of talk, of parcel specific talk, like the, the Rite Aid parcel, the little triangle uh, in front of Green Tomato were given as, as examples of, hmm, we could probably do something more with that, especially if we had uh, the the community will to maybe either do planters or even dig up pavement um, if places like that provide their opportunities. There were also some interesting ideas about reconfiguring if the opportunity presented itself where parking is and where green space is. So Main Street, we have parking, we have commercial spaces, parking, and then green space. Christopher's, we have a lot of parking there that's also used as a cut through. I know I've used it that way to maybe turn around when you need to turn around. And so can we think about and reimagine some of the spaces and that relationship to vehicles that we have now to make it still friendly for vehicles, but also friendly for open space, bikes, pedestrians. Um, we talked about a walkability index, taking a look at, okay, where are the spaces in town and in the smart growth district where people really don't where there might be more people that would use a parcel of open space. Um, 
and I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but that was, there were lots and lots of really great creative ideas and some parcel specific ideas to help us get there. If we have time, I'll open it up to anybody who has a burning thing that I omitted accidentally. I could only add that we talked about the maintenance of sidewalks and these spaces and how that can be a barrier uh, to either developing or utilizing some of these areas. Yes, and with that, I'll add if, if I didn't, I think I did, there were lots of ideas about you know, just getting people connected to other spaces. And yes, maintenance, especially winter maintenance, clearing mm -hmm. sidewalks was cited several times as a real barrier to enjoying the open space, including the sidewalk open space that we have. Somebody mentioned the train station and all the municipal parking there as an area that could be turned into a arts or a concert or a farmer's market space. I, that was very exciting to me. Yeah. Overall, it was really cool to hear people thinking about, you know, we have space. It's just that what's on the space is more concrete than we might want a lot of it to be right now. And there's probably something we can do with that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so uh, the parking um, breakout session um, had some uh, good discussion in that. Uh, I, I'm going to start off by saying it was sort of agreed that that this time uh, of where we are right now is a little bit hard to talk about parking um, and about the parking issues just between uh, between where we are in, in the development phase plus the plus the pandemic. Um, hard to reach back in our minds to think about all the the parking issues that we knew were there. Um, back in in 2019, and imagine forward um, what those how those <laughs> might play out with when um, when all the uh, people um, populate the the new buildings. But right, still need to still need to think through still need to think through these things. Um, I think uh, I guess uh, first and foremost there was um, a, a, um, a discussion about the 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 need that whatever else we do in the in the district that in order to support the businesses we need to make sure that we're maintaining um we're maintaining um uh parking uh for those for those businesses um right that's that's easy to say um uh but you know it, it was i think universally felt that, that that's an important thing to, to maintain the, the business the maintain the parking for for businesses and examples um, of you know when you don't provide that parking then then those businesses really not only don't thrive but they they don't do um, they, they may even go belly up so um, so that was one thing is you know sort of putting some um, uh, making sure that that whatever we change that we are um, we are maintaining, um, capacity for for parking and not squeezing parking out, uh, at least commercial parking. Um, uh, and then I, I'm going to say related to that, um, there was uh, discussion that um, that really, you know, we talked about whether the whether the exemption for commercial businesses, you know, um, being 300 feet from the from the municipal lots, whether that was a, a good idea or you know whether we should revisit that, and I and I um, number of comments about really the sense that we 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 need to be thinking about parking in this area um, in as a in total um, and not forcing the parking back to every individual uh, every indi individual parcel um, or or business owner. Um, or property owner, and so I, I, although it was never said, I think that there wasn't a lot of support for doing away with that um, with that exemption. Um, we we honestly right we talked a little bit about the um, about the um, uh, the parking requirements, the residential parking requirements, but not a big um, not a um, 
sub substantive um, uh, discussion uh, about that. Um, and um, and not much discussion really about loading uh, either is really more focused on you know commercial uh, the, the commercial parking needs. Uh, I, I'm sure I forgot something, so please you know anyone else in the group fill in where I where I left off. No, all right. You did a good job, John. Um, so that concludes our evening. I'll just, um, but before you leave, I'll just give you um, a little bit of an idea of what we're thinking um, with regards to like next steps on this conversation. So tonight was kind of like the beginning of what we see as kind of the big conversation that we want to have. Um, we'll have to, staff will have to reconvene and kind of look at the different jam boards and take the feedback collectively and, and see if there are pieces that can be broken off sooner. Like John mentioned, the parking conversation might need to wait until we're back to a time where things are a little more normal and we can kind of assess. Um, and, we, and we will also know more about the multifamily buildings downtown um, and the utilization there. Um, but there might be other things that we can look at sooner. I would say, um, it's probably unlikely we would have zoning bylaw amendments for November town meeting this year, just because we're starting this conversation now um, and it's almost April. Um, and there's a lot more like research and, and outreach that we need to do. Um, but maybe in one of, at one of the town meetings in 2022, I guess that would be right. Um, and then, you know, really like tonight's feedback will be used to kind of try to inform those policy level, zoning amendment level, um, um, that we look at. So um, feel free to email me or Andrew um, or Aaron at Town Hall anytime if you like leave tonight's meeting and you think of something that you really want us to, to consider. Um, and then stay tuned also for um, additional meetings that we'll have when we talk about these topics. Um, and this presentation from tonight will be posted on the Community Planning and Development Commission site on the town, town website. And may I give you my personal thanks, Julie, Andrew, and Aaron, for a good yes. presentation and good research to get this done, as well as to Heather and Nick and to John for heading up those groups. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thank you. And, and Thank thanks, you. this is all good stuff, right? Um, right. It's, um, uh, there'll be more conversations, but hopefully this gets us going in the right direction. Yeah, it's been great, it was great. The turnout was great. I'm very excited about this. So thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank right. you everybody. Night. Thanks. Night. Happy, Happy Thank spring. <laughs> Julie, can I ask one, one quick thing? It's Cindy. Sure. Um, sure. Yes, Cindy. The parking conversation made me think about the area um, that is like the drive to, to Market Basket where the construction vehicles park. I think it's supposed to be overflow train parking. And yeah. it made me think about the Walker's Brook. And I just wanted to flag it that it's, uh, I, I don't wanna be, want it to be allowed to be buried any further. And in fact, exposing it, cre increasing access to it, it could be part of uh, this idea of open space and green links if we could create a path next to the brook, you know, I, I really don't want to lose the brook any further. Um, and that didn't come up when we were talking about open space, no. I, although water features came up and there's a free one right there. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. It's all good. Thank you for thank that. You. That's great ideas. Thank you, Cindy. One other question I, I, as people are uh, signing off, how do we prevent there to be a rush of development? <laughs> between now and whenever town meeting gets to this uh, discussion, um, you know, there could be just uh, knowing the developers knowing that there's going to be a change could come in and just grab all kinds of property, uh, push it through the development board. And, uh, and then meanwhile, town meeting is kind of waiting for proposals. What happens between now and then? So there's no good way to do that. Um, the 40 R statute actually prohibits the town from having a moratorium or subjecting the downtown smart growth district to a moratorium. Um, and we don't, 
from the town side really have any control over when private lands go for up for sale or when they transact um, or when developers get the financing and the design and all that, that work that goes into like preparing a development proposal to ready to come to town hall. Um, does anyone, I don't have a good answer to that, Bernie. Um, the longer we wait, the worse it potentially could get. So I guess the question is why can't we have something done? You know, I know, I know it's obviously uh, very quick for April, but uh, why couldn't we have some set of proposals that would, um, you know, move us in that direction without having to wait to November? Julie? Yes, Angela. Um, I think the work has closed for April. And also, um, I, I think that there are guidelines and zoning in place so that as long as the CPDC and the ZBA understands that, uh, you know, where we're going, no waivers would need to be permitted, right? I mean, it's not like we have no guidelines. It's not like we have no provisions. It's just that we, they don't have to be bypassed. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the reason we're having this is because uh, with, all, with all those guidelines and, and Constra constraints and checks and balances in the system. We've got buildings going up with 100% lot coverage, and it doesn't seem like there's there's any incentive for the town to not let that happen because it just may, you know, it's more tax revenues for the town. And <clears throat> we'll stop that with the tax revenues. We we haven't given anybody 100%. There's no lots available where they could actually do that. I thought you said earlier in our discussion that there was 100% coverage. That's on the, yeah, that's the number too, but that's it's not very easily achieved. The but I, I, I think, Bernie, Bernie, to your point, I'm not so sure that we have a proposal, right? I, I wasn't in all the breakout sessions, but right there, there, there isn't a consensus of what a proposal is. So, well, and, you know, I mean, we, the idea of throwing out a number to Julie's point earlier is that if you throw out a number like 50%, there's a number, right? I mean, what are the implications of that without exploring that, without knowing whether it's just a waste of town meetings time because no one's going to build that? So probably wouldn't approve us to do that either. Right. Uh, right. That's the other part. Uh, I mean, it's it's hard for yeah. everyone to get their head around the technical aspects of what we actually are allowed to do. And I've said before, we have very little control. Design guidelines give us a little bit more. But you know, property oh. owners have rights, and uh, they have they have more leverage than we do. Yeah, I, think I also right. should clarify for everyone what Angela said that this April town meeting, like that's in um, you know a month from now, is not was never on the table in terms of like a zoning amendment for this because um, it was closed in February. Um, and I was saying earlier that I think even November of this year, given all of the competing priorities for our time, um, and just the fact that like Nick and John were saying like we don't necessarily even really know where we're going yet with this. Um, is probably unlikely that we would have something ready for November town meeting. Julie, can I ask a question? This is Sarah Brucolacchio. Hi, Sarah. Hi, my question is why are variances given for these, for these smaller lots? Are, are you question. referring to the question that got brought up earlier that we didn't get a chance to, the, the are you referring to the um, the issue about the the affordable housing. No, I'm talking about waivers. I'm I think they mean about, waivers. Okay, excuse me. I'm sorry. You're right. Thanks, Pam. Waivers. The waivers that are being given for like Chapin Ave and for Woburn Street and these tiny lots. I mean, that was never in the discussion for 40R. It was about larger properties. I thought there was some sort of a a size that that 40R was supposed to be in, and then. It just seems like there's that anyone can ask for a waiver and it's just granted. You know how the density waivers and um, especially the lot waiver. I mean, I remember a couple of jokes being made about how somebody couldn't turn a house into a forty yard because it wasn't enough land space, but now it is. The the whole, I guess the whole, um, the whole way that the design guidelines are structured um, are the one 
meat that we that the town does have you know nick said we don't have very much control the one control that we do have is um our, our waivers um are, are some of those things that we know um developments will require waivers for um uh, you know and on 95 percent of the the projects and so um and so you know the the expectation has always been that um that any development right because we have such small lots we have you know there's there's such restriction on every single lot in downtown that that in order to develop anything you will need at least one waiver so you know the the there's never been an expe expectation that that waivers would not would not be required it was just that that's the one tool um you know because without a waiver uh, right, they, it's almost it's a it's almost like a by right development. And they can do whatever you know without even barely coming to us, um, and so that that's that is what we uh, that that is what we use um, to to work. That's our leverage um, to work with developers to get what what um, the best um, the the best development we can get out of that developer. So I guess it's it just doesn't seem like the 40R was it was the intention for it to be for any size lot and to grant waivers all along because when you go to the meetings and the abutters are there and they're saying you know this is crazy for instance the chronicle site you know the density that they wanted to build there and all that so why is that even something that people have to like fight for it would seem like the CPDC would not want that either like why do they give these waivers why can't they just say no <laughs> oh we did <laughs> so you say no to a waiver and they can just have it anyway i thought that wasn't possible with 40r i, I guess i wish you'd be more a little more specific but um like john was saying the waivers are are one of the tools to sort of craft the development that meets the needs of both the property owner and the neighborhood and the town. Are you talking about the waiver for the minimum number of affordable units? No, no, the number of units, the housing density. The density. Yep. Well, if I may, uh, there's also a problem that we cannot unreasonably restrict the, the, uh, afford the, Building. I hate to use the term, but the profitability of the project, we can't make it economically unfeasible. And that's a huge um, question because what's uh, economically unfeasible? Mm -hmm. I also think that changes over time, right? It's not necessarily a fixed. That's true, but either way we would lose in court and it would cost us not only the lawyer's fees, but the development, because so, they win. We would never win that. Can I ask a question? Never win that. Can, can I ask a question? I, I'm hearing something that I've never heard before, and that is that a waiver would be used as a tool to do this. As a town meeting member, as somebody who's followed CPDC for many, many years, I've never thought of waivers as being the rule rather than the exception. So the idea that that, used as a tool uh, this is something that is new to me that, and it's a concept that i i'm not quite it, it shouldn't be angela um it, and it's really it goes back to the density um the 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 density level um and which is the one that i think that sarah is mentioning um even at when when um in the very first presentation you know if you go back to what that density what the allowed density um, would get you in town and I and I know that this was part of the original presentation if if you go back to what that density would allow um, you we nothing would be developed in Reading would we would have zero um, 40 yard development because that that level is so is so small, and maybe I'm exaggerating there, Julie. But 
Um, but you know, it, it would be very, it would be very limited if we never granted that that waiver. And I I know that that was discussed at the very first, um, you know, when 40R um, the downtown smart growth was enacted, because that okay. that's why that was set that way. That's why that was set at that level. Can't, can't we say we've reached a threshold for 40R and draw back our downtown smart growth, whatever outline and say we're done? We, we could, I think, and, and, and Julie, there's, there's some other limitations that have come up in the, in the meantime. Um, and I, I think they're still, right, the, the rules are still being written by the governor and by, um, um, or by the legislature. But um, but we now not only have to worry about 40B, but right where there's some other rules that say, you know, if you're near right commuter rail line, you have to have certain densities and stuff. And so so the pressure the pressure on towns like us that have a commuter rail station that are, you know, within the, you know, within the 128, the I-95 belt. Um, you know, the, the pressure is getting even greater um, at the state level to keep up with our housing demand, um, which is why Julie went over that whole piece at the beginning is, you know, this, this, we are keeping up with our housing demand and that housing demand is going where, where, ta where the town through the master plan said that that housing should go. And, you know, the, the bulk of that was driven to to downtown, if we if we want to stop developing, you know, then what? In this, I'm not saying this is a scare tactic or whatever, but right, the demand will still be there, and then it will turn into to 40B um, uh, developments, and some of them may be okay, um, and some of them will not be okay, um, and and this is the way that we saw. You know, I think someone asked about why 40R. But this is the way that we saw to, you know, to be able to have a tool where we could craft um, and and be at the table um, in, instead of being told what a developer was going to do. So, is the remedy then to contact the state and work with the state on changing what they are? Because what I'm seeing with the 40R here in Reading is that it's really um, it's changing the whole identity of our downtown where 40B is more on the fringes outside of the downtown area. The not, Lincoln not Street property uh, is a 40B. Pardon me? The Lincoln Street property is a 40B across okay. from the depot. Okay, but right now I'm talking about the very downtown area, you know, and it's just the, where there's more historical properties. Um, yeah, the Lincoln Street property, but that was an eyesore property. No, but remember that is outside the boundary. And that's why that's a 40B project. Originally, the boundary wanted to include that because we wanted to protect that piece. We mm. knew it was a viable piece of land, we wanted to protect it. Nobody wanted to include it. And uh, how are you going to no protect there. it? How are you going to protect it? If we, had, if we had put that into the 40R boundary, we would have had more control over its development. As a 40B property, we had very little control. I don't see a difference between that property and the 40R properties. I don't know what you would have, what do you mean? What would you have done differently? Well, it would have a commercial base for one thing, potentially, and it would have more setbacks. We just have, we just have more control. We would have had more control over it. But like, for instance, on 18 Woburn Street, isn't there no setback? I mean, that one seems like it's asking for the moon and the stars there. It's like gonna, gonna be abutting a municipal parking spots and you know, there'll be no green space, uh, waivers on the housing density. I don't see where there's control on that. And that hasn't been approved yet. Okay. Right, we do look, and I don't know if you saw, but you know what came, what originally was proposed at, um, at um, the Chronicle Building, right? Dramatically right. different than than what was was approved, dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and so, right, that's the process. That's the process that that we can use to shape something that that you know that may not be great. Um, you know, may not be exactly what the neighbors want. 
which probably would be, you know, a, a park there. Um, but right, that's not, um, you know, that that the owner of that property is going to do something with it. I think what you're saying is like the way we're a lot of people are feeling is that may not be right. There should be a park there. But is anybody working on that? Like, how will that ever happen? How will we get uh, a park? I will suggest I'll throw it out to the people that are still on this meeting that the if we want more parks, right, it's not the CBDC and a zoning issue. It's the um, it's the um, Julie's shaking her head and now I'm forgetting what the CPA. What the, yeah, community the CPA, the Community Preservation Act, where a uh, percentage of of all um, uh, of all real estate transactions go into a fund. Right. You look around other towns, how yeah. they've used Community Preservation Act, and I can almost guarantee you that everything that was talked about here has been done in other communities by preserving um, historic, you know, historic buildings, putting in buying property and putting in parks and that sort of thing um uh and that's my plug is that's my take on what we should be doing the town of reading voted it down uh 20 year 20 years ago maybe now i don't maybe that number isn't right but it sure feels like it was about 20 years ago um it hasn't brought the issue up since and you look around the rest of the rest of the commonwealth of all the communities that have the Community Preservation Act and do all these things, um, and we are sitting by the wayside. Right. If we own the property, if the town, if the town owned the property, the town could set parameters for what the development was to be. Right. So a mm -hmm. large enough piece of parcel could be you, here's 50% of the lot for you to develop, and the rest is our park or some other type of open space. Or the whole thing could be park. You know, it would be our land to decide what to do with. Right now, we're dealing with private property. They have rights, um, and we're trying to control as much of it as we can for the benefit of the of the neighborhood. So, is the Community Preservation Act something for town meeting to pick up, or who? who how does that happen? Yeah, is that a two-thirds yeah. vote too, Angela? Something like that. I don't remember if it's a two-thirds or not. I'd have to I, look into it. I mean, uh, it's a tax. Face it, it's a tax. So you know, so, not, not many people are willing to add to the tax base. So it's a very small tax, and it has money back from the government, from the state, and it goes to many more things than it did when it was first initiated. So it could go to historical preservation, but it also could go to um, recreation now. So there's lots of, uh, at the Birch Meadow, there's a lot of things that it could go for now. And John, I, I wanna say that it wasn't 20 years ago. I'm not that old. I would say 15 <laughs> years, maybe. All right. But All it, right. Was, it, was, it, it was defeated, but it was not defeated by a lot. So I think that there is appetite now to bring it back so that we can have downtown space, we can have park space, we can have Birch Meadow accommodations. So I think that would be a really good thing for the town and town meeting to think about. Right. I, I do think, right, I do think that that's a tool, um, you know, zoning is an awkward tool to use. I do think the Community Preserva Preservation Act is a tool that can be used to achieve a lot of things that the town is trying to do in general. Not just downtown, but like you said, recreation, Birch Meadow. Right. Whether yeah, you like it or not, Walker's Brook was the towns dump to do what they wanted with so whether you like the development that happened there the town was able to set some of the parameters for that this has been so educational and uh, in our breakout group um the example of newbury port came up and beverly and maybe even i don't know the other one was that there was a cultural center and you know that that the town's identity grew up from the center is that is that through the and lexington comes to mind lexington and reading used to be very similar <laughs> way back um is that part through the community either newbury or lexington from the community protection act or whatever preservation act 
yeah, both of those communities do have, I can guarantee, I know Lexington does. Yeah. I would be shocked if, if Newburyport doesn't. Uh, Rockport, Rockport does use it as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think in the case of the, the uh, Performance Center in Rockport, yeah. it's been a ter ter terribly good magnet. That was primarily funded through uh, people raising money from yeah. people who lived there. And they raised a fair amount of money, bought the property. Yeah. It, of course, it, it tr transitioned from tax-paying private property to uh, 501c3 non-tax-paying yeah. property, which is another problem, but uh, you could argue maybe it brings in, it, but it, it, it certainly livened up the place, no doubt about it. Yeah. Is it possible to create a, and that's nothing like a good deadline to get things done. Um, you know, I, I'm hearing that maybe we could, maybe we could, we can't do anything for April. Um, we started this in last November. Now we're thinking, well, maybe it'll be November, maybe it won't be November. I think we really have to establish a deadline that says by, you know, we'll give a, we'll give an update on this to the town meeting. Uh, by June 15th, we'll have uh, proposals and that'll get ready for November. I, I think to try to wait until, to, to miss a November opportunity would be, you know, tragic for the, for the input from the town. So can we establish a deadline where we get this done? If you promise to um, to come and attend to all our meetings and contribute, absolutely. We'll do. I mean, all right. Yeah, this has been great. Usually there's five or six of us trying to figure out all angles on it. When we get this many people yeah. in here, we can see many more viewpoints, which is much more helpful. Yes. It's really helpful to know that there are some people who are of like mind that we don't want to just put a bunch of big apartment blocks up downtown. So that that was encouraging, at least from my perspective. Do we do we have June fifteenth as a as a potential uh, deadline? I'm not agreeing to that. I'm just saying that right now. What what are there any time constraints that would? There are just so yeah. so so many things that we have. Rem going on remember right that we can only do things in in a in in a public meeting, um, right? And so that you, we we can't even do anything by June fifteenth. Right, we have one meeting or two. So we have a meeting in April that's full, and then we have town meeting, and then we have a couple meetings right around town meeting to deal with a backlog of outdoor commerce dining programming and storage applications that we have if the zoning amendment passes at town meeting. Um, and we have a lot in the pipeline. So I don't know when we would be discussing this next. Maybe at some point in May, we could talk about it again. I don't know if we'll have a proposal ready. But that doesn't mean people can't send their input, right. too. Correct. So we can keep collecting that. I mean, I think we have a lot of very smart people that probably could craft some proposals and then, you know, put them up for discussion. And then, without that, it's, you know, we could just think about this stuff for years without anything ever getting done. I think that's the problem. You folks know that, you know, know, know the issues I think better than a lot of us. Maybe it would be helpful to... Yeah, but how many is there a requirement as to how many meetings we need to have before we we make a recommendation to town town meeting? No, there isn't. But right, we 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 there's we can't do this all in one meeting. Uh, George, did you? Did yeah, you I, just wanna, I just want to say that uh, you know it's sort of the eighty twenty rule. You know, you get eighty percent of the way there. Then I think the town meeting expressed a desire to address all these things i think by november which would have been a year after you know after the uh, the motion on this to at least give a status report and saying we are looking at the following we're having this discussion and as we go forward we will con conclude things by whether it's you know in 2022 or whenever but please come to our meetings to be able to provide your input. So I think that the town meeting deserves a, an update. Yeah, oh, we, we plan to yeah. give an update in April. We definitely, that's a good point that you made, George. We definitely plan to give an update on this in April and we can give another update on it in November, um, which by that point, hopefully we will, will have made a lot of progress. I just don't think we would have anything ready. We would need to have, like there's a time frame that the state sets forward for zoning amendments, right? So we need to have hearings we have to have a public hearing for any zoning amendments at some point in the summer. We usually aim to do them in June. Um, sometimes they, 
they start in June and then get continued a couple times into July. And then the warrant closes in late August, early September usually. So um, I just think the timing is a little tight given all the other competing priorities that we have for our time right now. Um, lots of things I know that we're working on in the planning office that has okay. so one of the yeah, local I, recovery planning grant that we got from the state that has a six month window um, and a lot of work involved um, was supposed to end in August. And that's just one of the many things that we have going on. So I just trying to do all of that. I'm thinking, I don't know if it's realistic to say that we would have a concrete proposal ready by June, um, but we can definitely give updates and keep working on it behind the scenes. And, Please keep ten attending our meetings. Um, yeah, I think I think updates are important. And again, look at the number of people who attended. I, my, I myself, for example, if you had an in person and not the Zoom, I could not attend. And so I think uh, with having a hybrid, even a hybrid type of situation, you will get more involvement by the community. You know, things change. You know, a lot of things, hopefully for the better, will change after this awful past year. Yep. Thank you. All right. Just one, I mean, I mean, I think that the question is, what are the potential things that we have to change here? We have things like setbacks, height requirements, parking, and open space requirements. Um, there aren't, I mean, maybe there are more, uh, more, more issues, but if we wrote those all down and had some proposals about that, what's more there, what is, what's more to talk about? I mean, I, uh, I, I see, I see the danger here is that we're delaying things out past November, which gives a huge opportunity to development to come through. Are, to Bernie, we are not, we are not, you, you heard what Julie said. There's a timeline for getting all this stuff. We're not going to have something ready for November. It's just not, it's just not, we can't get there. I guess I, yeah. I, 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 I know you want, I, I hear that you want your, you, that you want that to happen, but we we're not we're not there. I guess what I was just trying to understand is what is the what are the requirements for the timeline and what is the what is the timeline that you know what what are the milestones that need to be met before a proposal can be made to town meeting. So so Bernie, there aren't proposals that are made to town meeting. There are warrant articles. So okay. for in order for CPDC to put through a warrant article, it needs to have a hearing. It needs to uh, have a time frame. It needs to be written out, and it needs to meet the select board's time frame. You don't give a, a proposal to town meeting. You give a warrant article, which has its own requirements. All right. So uh, I guess what I'm my question, which I I, I guess I'm, I'm not here to answer, is what what are the number of meetings? Is there a certain required number of meetings? Is there a time space between those meetings i mean if we had another meeting where we had you know some considered proposals on things like you know the, the various parameters that are the key milestones to <clears throat> we want what what's the what's what's the big deal i mean I, i'm sorry I, all right bernie let's start with the simple stuff yep uh it's a two-week minimum notif notice for any meeting yep all right now we know that the warrant closes at the, let's call it the beginning of September. Right. So we need to have voted on the proposal. We need to have public meetings on it. We need to develop it. And you're not looking at a 40 hour week here. You're looking at basically on a good month, eight hours, seven, 12, four hours, two nights a week. So that's where the real problem comes in. You're dealing, you're not dealing with uh, normal time here. You're dealing with uh, a volunteer group working part-time on the development. And that's just assuming nobody has any comment. For example, tonight we just spent, we were gonna spend two hours. We've now spent almost three hours. And the more people who comment, which we have to allow public comment, the longer the process takes. So we can't make a promise to you that, well, we could do it today, tomorrow, and, and done. It just is not developed the same way as you would in the business world. My boss tells me he wants something by the end of the month. I get it to him by the end of the month. Unfortunately, we, we have other bosses, which are the laws, the regulations that we have to follow to get this done. 
We're moving yeah. forward. We're moving forward pretty much as fast as we can, but there are limits to what can be done. The CPDC. In addition to that, um, the Department That's of an point, Community the Development at the state also has to review any proposal that we would make to change the 40 r zoning. So they and they take their time in doing that. And the last time we did it, um, when we expanded the district, I, I mean, there were at least a couple months involved in their review and all the back and forth and looking at parcels specifically and figuring out whether we'd be unreasonably impairing. And, and there was a lot of work that went into that. Um, and another piece is that we always have town council review the warrant articles before they go on the warrant. So we have to back that up now a couple of weeks, right, from the September date. So there's just a lot of stuff built into the process. Right. I just have a hard time thinking is gonna be realistic um, for us to accomplish for November town meeting. Right. No, I, I'm just trying to educate myself on the, the process and the timeline, so. So um, is it wise to have a two prong approach so that there, there is a group that's working on the zoning board laws and then another group that's trying to revive the Community Preservation Act? I mean, it means maybe we can come at this in a bunch of different ways. I, I'm new to this, but it sounds like we need more than one hammer for this job. Um, I I, you know, we'll continue to, to plug away on the, the zoning approach. Um, I, you know, I, I put the, the Community Preservation Act um, idea out there. I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure, right, that it's um, not a CBDC thing that we can necessarily drive. And um, I, I'm not so sure, I, I'm going to even put it to, to, not put it to Angela, but Angela might be the the one that would know the best about how an initiative like that w would get started. Um, um, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> um, um, so I think that's probably, a, 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 I'm gonna say a separate discussion, um, um, but I, I'm happy to be part of it. So I'm just not so sure that CPDC to, to drive that. Well, look, I'd be I'd be happy to help um, craft some language if people are interested in uh, working with me. But uh, I mean, if, if it was an ad hoc group that was attempting to put together some things for discussion purposes, it could be done. You know, I could help it with that, and then we could put it for the next meeting with a two week notice period, get the discussion on it, and see where it goes. I just was picking up on the energy towards trying to preserve what you know Sarah was talking about, preserve the identity of this town and um, the concern even from 14 year olds that it was turning into a bunch of high rises. And my background's 19th century American literature and history. And so the, Reading used to be a real hub, a real you know central location that people came to. And I think that with for public lectures and things, so that might be interesting to push a little anyway yeah I, I um i'm on the rec committee and we've talked to oh am i muted no you are no okay i'm on the rec committee and we've talked about um the cpa also so julia i'll give my email address to you and you can pass it on to people who are interested in talking about the cpa is that okay yeah that's fine um People can email me at town hall if they're interested in that and I can connect you to Angela. Does that sound okay with you, Angela? That's great, thank you. And um, let me just, I'll screen share my email address really quick for you. Um, just give me one second. Yeah, because I do think, right, the, CP, the CPA, right, there's, um, I, I think the, Right, the historical commission may have some interest in that. Um, uh, certainly, you know the the development and um, uh, green space issues that we talked about. Um, right, the the um, uh, I'd see uh, like almost every board <laughs> in Reading may have some interest in 
um, in you know different aspects of the the CPA and what it could do for for them. So I'm not so sure who takes the the lead on that. And um, uh, but I, I got to imagine that there's there would be widespread interest at least in the discussion of whether that's something that should should go to town meeting. Thank you. My only last comment would be, is it possible for us to post the design um, requirements and zoning laws that we are uh, subject, that, that, that our discussion is um, centered on, uh, you know, to put them all up on the uh, presentation that Julie's going to put just so that we haven't, because I have no idea really what we're talking about. Is it, is it five paragraphs? Is it 20 pages? Is it, uh, you know, I mean, I know that there was a town meeting uh, proposal to, to uh, amend a certain zoning, or I'm not sure if it was a zoning requirement or, or a design requirement, but yeah, maybe that would be helpful just so that we have our, an idea of what we're talking about here. I can link those on the web page um, on this zoning workshop that I provided earlier. I can certainly do that. That'd be really helpful, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, part of it is chasing the requirement through, right? So if we change something in a table, we have to chase it through to see what the implications are anywhere else. We don't want to somehow add a restriction that, that um, kills something else. Yeah, no, I think that's where I, I certainly have a disadvantage. You, you folks have a tremendous history and, and uh, domain knowledge that I certainly don't have, but yeah. That's, that's why Tony's I'm here. Tony's here because he's memorized the whole code. <laughs> John reads annual reports. I apparently do. <laughs> I've read the whole thing. 40, 40 years myself. <laughs> All right. Everybody. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's really yeah. good for help. Thank you all for your time. Oh my gosh, for years of it, it sounds like. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. This has been um, a great meeting. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Thanks. Have a good night.